everyone for joining. Um, we're here for the African Aquaculture Challenges and Opportunities event. My name is Caroline Griffin and I'm a Knowledge Transfer Manager in the Agri-Food team here at Innovate UK KTN. So before we start, just a few uh, brief housekeeping notes. So just to let you all know that the meeting is being recorded and the recording will be available um, fairly soon after um, once we've got everything sorted with it. Um, also, please do introduce yourself in the chat. And if you have any questions for our speakers or panelists today, please type these in the chat. We'll try to answer as many as we are able to during the Q&As and the panel session. You should remain muted throughout the webinar, but there'll be a networking session at 10 past 12, where you'll be able to speak directly with other attendees. So first of all, I just want to give you a brief introduction to Innovate UK KTN and why we're all here today. So Innovate UK KTN supports innovation through building connections. We work to support innovation both in the UK and internationally through our global alliance team. This event's part of the Agri-Food Africa Connect, which is part of the Global Challenges Research Fund Agri-Food Africa program. With the Agri-Food Africa Connect, we want to bring together innovative people and organizations across the UK and Africa to address key challenges in the African agri-food sector. We're doing this through growing connections and building communities focused around specific sectors and topics. We're supporting new collaborations with our innovation awards, and we work to disseminate information from existing funding like the Agritech and Energy Catalyst. So why are we here? We're here to talk about African aquaculture and production is gradually increasing, but there's still huge potential for growth. And there's been an increase in investments in recent years, especially in Egypt, Nigeria, Uganda and Ghana. The majority of productions from inland freshwater systems is mostly dominated by tilapia and African catfish, but seaweed and shellfish are becoming emerging sectors. Aquaculture is becoming increasingly important in Africa, both to provide sustainable and nutritious food to growing populations and to improve livelihoods. Increase in demand creates both challenges and opportunities, like improving sustainability and achieving net zero targets. We're going to be hearing from aquaculture producers about some of the issues that they're facing and then dive deeper into the challenges faced by the sector as a whole. And with this event, we want to bring together those working in the space to learn from previous experiences, to discuss the priorities and facilitate impactful introductions, partnerships and collaborations. We want to determine areas and support in identifying technologies and knowledge that can be applied across geographies to begin to practically connect those with relevant ideas. So I'll just briefly run through the agenda. First of all, we're going to hear from Colin Shelley from World Fish, who's going to give us a brief overview of the African aquaculture sector and a summary of the challenges and opportunities for growth. Next, we'll hear from Grant Stenterford from, C uh, from CFAS on the outcomes of the CFAS and FCDO-led One Health Aquaculture African workshop, which uh, took place recently, and we're going to get some feedback from their discussions. And then we have Margaret Crumlish and... Aloysius, sorry Aloysius if I pronounced your name incorrectly, from the Institute of Aquaculture at the University of Stirling, he'll be talking about infectious disease and biosecurity. And finally in this section, in a change to what we originally advertised, we have Harrison Juma from Tunga Nutrition, who will be speaking about the issues and challenges facing the aquaculture feed industry. So a special thank you to Harrison for um, stepping in at quite short notice. Um, Next on the agenda, we're going to have a break for 10 minutes and then we're going to come back and hear some case studies from producers and researchers. Um, and this will be followed by a Q&A, which will give you the opportunity to ask speakers from this session any questions that you might have. We'll then have another break um, of 15 minutes, which will give you a chance to get a coffee or stretch your legs. Um, and then we're going to come back to um, a panel session, which will hopefully be chaired by Etienne Henrichson from African Aquaculture Magazine, although he, he's having some connection difficulties at the moment. So if not, I will step in and chair that session. Um, and then after that, we're going to move on to a networking session with the opportunity to connect directly with others. So um, all I need to do now is pass over to our first speaker, who is Colin Shelley, who's the project lead at World Fish. So 
Um, Colin, I'm going to share my slides for you, so if you're ready. Great. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, my name is Colin Shelley. I'm a project leader with World Fish, running a project in Bangladesh and uh, Nigeria. So Carolyn's asked me to give a, a brief interview, uh, sorry, brief overview of what's happening in African aquaculture. And I've sort of entitled it African Aquaculture 2.0, and I'll explain to you what I think that means moving forward. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, just to bring people up to speed, uh, I was recently in Egypt at the really excellent AFRIC 2021 uh, conference and trade exhibition, and that was a fantastic opportunity to network with African organizations, farmers, and the aquaculture business opportunity. There's over 200 abstracts uh, were printed there and another run, a number of other presentations provided. There was uh, Mr. Abdelikim Alouia, the FAO Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for the Near East and North Africa, gave a really excellent overview about unlocking aquaculture prospects in Africa and the Near East. So if you've got an opportunity to read that, uh, I can strongly recommend it. As Carolyn was saying, tilapia and African catfish are the two big species produced in Africa. Uh, all fresh water and uh, as she said mariculture is at the moment poorly uh, developed in most countries but certainly there's opportunities for the future of course water in Africa is, is a very significant commodity you know some countries have lots of it in others it's extremely limited next slide please This paper, paper 211, which uh, Etienne and a team of people produced, uh, gives a really good introduction to what, what has happened in African aquaculture development in, in recent years and the potentials moving forward. It outlines a number of policy and investment priorities to support the growth of a sustainable, climate resilient and equitable aquaculture centre in Africa as an integral part of food systems moving forward. And I think particular attention needs to be paid to engaging and building the capacities for the small scale actors in this sector, uh, you know, to, for local food security, employment and income generation. One of the interesting things about the paper, it, it brings out a lot of similarities, but there are very, a lot of differences between countries as well. So it's very important moving forward to have country specific development plans and strategies. Next slide. So in terms of the uh, African Blue Economy Strategy, this is an important document for Africa and fisheries, aquaculture and ecosystems conservation is, is one of the five thematic areas in that document. Um, from an aquaculture perspective, one of the initiatives linked to this is the Centres of Excellence in Fisheries and Aquaculture, which was initiated in, in 2018. And I think they'll be playing an important role moving forward. Some of the things, some of the themes I think you'll hear heard reflected today about include cost effective fish feeds, the challenge of uh, you know, logistics, getting things from one place to another in the country, the utility of clusters and cooperatives uh, as a mechanism for industry development. Um, and you'll hear about fish seed, the need for hatcheries to deliver quality genetically improved stock. Um, importantly, uh, marketing at the moment in most countries is very basic. There's lots of opportunities to improve those value chains, diversify post harvest products. And in terms of investments, whilst the, there's plenty of interest in the larger companies for the smaller operators, again, working in clusters and cooperatives, I think there'll be opportunities for investment moving forward. Other areas for investment, and I think you'll hear more about it later, obviously in fish health, which is critical to the future development of the sector, and production technology, um, precision aquaculture, alternative energy sources, and of course there's a massive need for training and capacity building. And I think like most other, most other continents, most other areas of aquaculture around the world, digital 
the platform is going to be incredibly important. Next slide, please. Aquaspark's um, excellent uh, publication or report recently about uh, what their, their sort of investment strategy is in tilapia, I think shows the interest of the sort of um, investment community in, in African agriculture. You know, they've identified 50 million growing to 3 million, 300 million over the next six to eight years investment in Africa, I think which gives everybody a feeling for the enthusiasm for the development of African agriculture. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, the large based farms are already attracting significant investment. And I think it, in, hopefully within a few years, some of the cooperatives and cluster farm groups will grow into investment ready operations. Next slide, thanks. Communications uh, and transfer of information in Africa are incredibly important. And one of the tools that we've been using together with Scretting, Wish and Ala Aqua has been through the African Agriculture Magazine, which uh, we've been working with over the last few years. So this is enabling um, communication across industry on a very large scale. I think they currently have a, a list of seven or 8,000 people, many of which attend their regular webinars. And the people attending the webinars include farmers, companies supporting the sector, public servants, researchers, students, and universities have benefited um, from uh, showcasing their, their work and what can be done in their universities. So the webinars have included country specific events, production research, and a range of presentations from universities that have helped to share uh, opportunities. Next slide, thanks. This uh, very interesting paper uh, did some modeling looking at business as usual uh, for the development of the aquaculture industry and a high growth scenario for both fisheries and aquaculture over the next uh, few years. In fact, through to 2030 and then through to 2050. And under the business as usual, um, over 20 million jobs will be created in this sector and 21.6 million by 2050. Um, and when you consider that for every person directly employed in the industry, there'll be another 2.6 people employed, the benefits in terms of employment are going to be huge for the industry. Under the high scenario, um, employment in Africa's fish food system, we'll be looking at 58 million jobs by 2050. So between the low business as normal and what can be done with adequate investment and innovation, there's an absolutely enormous opportunity. So agriculture production is estimated to achieve 3 billion um, by 2050 under the business as, as usual. But if we can get significant growth in the right places, it could be as big as 20 billion per year. So obviously there's a, a lot of opportunities moving forward. Next slide, please. Looking at sustainable aquaculture development in sub-Saharan Africa, there were sort of six key areas identified that would be support the industry moving forward. So strategies for sustainable aquaculture growth, productive and efficient systems, genetically improved fish strains, fish health management, more affordable quality feeds, and appropriate policy and investment support. Next slide, thanks. So aquaculture 2.0. Just like the rest of the world, I think we're going to see a huge transition over the next decade from the sort of traditional experience based through to knowledge based farming systems. And I think that this is already being embraced by you know, the salmon, the prawn and other, other sectors. And I think part of what's required in, us, in Africa is to support industry at all levels in making that transition. Next slide, thanks. Some of the technologies that we're going to be, uh, I think a lot of the technologies that can be used to transform and innovate the sector uh, include digital, a range of digital platforms, everything from sensors, knowledge systems, such as those uh, AquaSim from Scretting, AquaEasy from Bosch, 
and aquanetics are all early examples of what where, where industry is going. And in, and in addition to a support training at scale with quality materials, I think the companies such as the Blue Planet Academy using high quality short format videos is a way to go. Um, and finance and microcredit you know, through the electronic uh, systems is, is also going to become increasingly important. I've got a little story about that a little bit later on. And some of the areas I think that you'll probably hear more about today um, to better understand, to get a, look at an, you know, use a new lens to look at aquaculture, and this is aquaculture everywhere, includes microbiome, fingerprinting, metagenomics, Live in a backpack and other new innovations that I think are really going to change the face of aquaculture in, in coming years. Next slide, thanks. So this is already happening in India. We're seeing digital platforms being used to transform the landscape. Uh, this is an example in India of a, a market platform. Next slide, please. In Indonesia, we're seeing through the e-fishery um, ecosystem where they include uh, feeds, funding, um, marketing as a, as a large integrated group. It's been very successful, attracted a lot of funding in recent days. There's similar opportunities for entrepreneurial development in Africa along these lines. So I think that model is extremely useful and, and interesting. Moving forward, accreditation, food security, traceability, environmental sustainability are all going to become major focuses in Africa as they are elsewhere. And you know, so I, I guess we're going to see Global Seafood Alliance, we're going to see the ASC and, and other companies, uh, other accrediting bodies becoming more important in this space. Critical tools, I think, uh, moving forward, Solar power, array, solar, you know, uh, renewable energy generally, incorporating it into the industry. Um, I mentioned the microbiome lens, food formulation, distribution, aquatic health management. Uh, next slide, thanks. There's a real key role for governments moving forward. World Fish, with other international groups, uh, has been playing a role in supporting um, the. Uh, governments in Africa in terms of their strategic and policy development. And some of the, the, the tools I think that can be used there include the development of, you know, aquaculture, economic zones, tax concessions, and then a full range of aquaculture services to make sure that aquaculture develops in a well-regulated manner. Next slide, thanks. So World Fish, um, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, we work with the sort of poorer end of the farming sector, developing pathways out of poverty, using aquaculture as a tool in low and middle income countries to create businesses uh, working at scale, often dealing with hundreds of thousands of farmers in countries like Bangladesh. Um, we have a new strategy on aquatic feeds for healthy people and planet, which provides details of our vision, mission and goals over the next decades. So please have a look at that. Um, looking at agriculture, looking at aquaculture in Africa, um, in sub-Saharan Africa, growth has been 11% annually on average uh, since 2000, so almost twice as fast compared to the rest of the world. So aquaculture is already growing very rapidly. Next slide, thanks. So what are some of the responses that World Fish is, is doing in relation to this? So with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the uh, Dolberg Consultants, we uh, have organized a concept, a Fish for African Innovation Hub. And I think it's important, we're thinking about how we can most productively and efficiently partner with other organizations in Africa at the moment. Next slide, thanks. So with this, uh, with this hub, four key areas for um, in involvement, you know, so genetics, value chain, data-driven improvements to industry and policy, and a big increase uh, in training throughout the sector. 
one of the things wherever we work is a major hurdle is access to affordable financial services. So I think we're going to have to be looking at innovation in that space. In other countries, we've been working with NGOs and micro credit, micro credit providers to provide funds to small uh, farmers and SMEs at affordable rates. So hopefully we can make some progress in Africa in that space. Next slide, thanks. So for those of you who haven't been to Egypt, um, this is our uh, Abassa research facility, just uh, one and a half hours outside of Cairo. It's really World Fish is sort of jewel in the crown for its agriculture activities, and it's going to play a major role in our future plans for Africa. As you can see, it's got over 60 ponds of various sizes, laboratories, including one recently commissioned by Scretting, um, a breeding center for the Ambassa or giant strain of tilapia uh, used in Egypt, an excellent accommodation for running aquaculture training courses. So in Egypt, we've been working alongside the government for over 25, 23 years, and its activities have arguably contributed in part, you know, to the country's impressive growth in aquaculture over the past decade, to, to over a million tonnes of tilapia are now being produced per year. Next slide, thanks. Okay, just a couple of final um, issues just to share with you. From Bangladesh, this is an example of some innovation working with Bank Asia. We introduced a, a fish card for very poor farmers so that they can buy inputs and um, uh, you know, seed and feed and then repay over significant periods of time um, at very low interest rates, you know, similar to ordinary bank rates, unlike most, uh, a lot of finance rates, you know, like MasterCard rates, which are found in many developing countries. So I think getting finance, you know, digital finance systems in place is a real opportunity moving forward. Next slide, please. And finally, one of the tools we found that works very effectively in Bangladesh um, is working with large networks of local service providers to disseminate services, inputs, and, and financial services at scale. And I think in the African context, um, we, we think from our preliminary work in countries like Nigeria, working with cooperative groups of farmers, um, we can have similar success in uh, improving, uh, providing a um, more efficient uh, ecosystem to distribute services you know, across the industry, which can really help bolster and support aquaculture innovation moving forward. So look, this has been a, a very brief overview and my sort of apologies for rushing through it, but I had a very limited period of time. Final slide, thanks. So thank you very much. Um, these uh, organizations are just some of the countries, some of the organizations that we work with um, uh, in Nigeria. There are many other uh, philanthropic organizations and uh, countries who work with in, in other countries. So thank you very much. Back to you, Carolyn. Thank you, Colin. That was great. A really great um, introduction to the topic um, and really interesting talk. So, um, so thanks again. And we'll be hearing later from Colin during the panel session. So now we're going to move on and speak to Professor Grant Stenterford from CFAS, um, who will be giving us a talk about um, a recent well, he'll be feeding back about a recent workshop that took place uh, with CFAS and the FCDO. Um, and so we'll hopefully hear some of the findings from that. So just, uh, I'll just pass over to you then, Grant. Thanks very much. Caroline, can you hear me, everyone? Okay. Yes, can you hear me? Just someone put their fingers up, yeah. Good. And the slides are there. Is that all good? Great. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so thanks very much. And, thank, uh, and also thanks to Colin, brilliant setup there. And um, really good to hear what, what World Fish are doing, um, their great work in, in Africa and beyond. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a concept that we've been working on um, in the UK called One Health Aquaculture. You may have read a little bit about this in recent years. 
Um, and also mentioned that workshop that Caroline um, just talked about that some of you actually probably came to just a few weeks back, another one of these online events um, when we're not actually meeting in person, but in our own offices and homes. So um, yeah, it would be nice to meet up again, wouldn't it? But um, we, we, it's pretty good to do this this way as well. I'm from CFAS. Um, CFAS is an agency of the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs in the UK. So we're government scientists who provide advice to our own department in the UK who handle aquaculture and fisheries and the environment, and, but also increasingly work um, with colleagues overseas to um, hopefully help them to do some of the things that they're trying to do. I'm a pathologist, so what kind of aquatic animal health, but what I'm gonna talk about here is a bit broader than that um, and bring in some of those wider um, skills that are gonna be needed in, in aquaculture. Um, yeah, so let's just sort of go on with that. I, I'm not gonna sort of reiterate really too much of what, what um, Colin mentioned, but this is a sort of analysis we've done very recently about who eats seafood and um, in, in the world and, and who makes it from aquaculture. And just sort of an interesting analysis really about you probably know there's already about 20 kilos per person per annum is, is the average you know, global consumption rate. Um, but that is really differently represented in, in, in different countries. And this sort of colorful chart on the left-hand side is one of my colleagues who's a, who's a, who's a, um, a phylogenist, a taxonomist, um, took the data for aquaculture or seafood consumption from the FAO and presented it in this way, looking at the relationships between who consumes what. And if you look at this sort of complicated chart, what you end up seeing is that there's nations at the top here, the details aren't important what, what they are, but there's nations which consume way above the average amount of seafood per person uh, per annum and mainly consume marine fish and, and have access to a wide, wider range of species, including mollusks and crustaceans and so on. And at the bottom of the, of, of the dendrogram are nations which consume almost neg negligible amounts of, of seafood, definitely less than five kilos per person per annum, and sometimes down to less than one kilo per person per annum, and are mainly consuming freshwater fish. So global consumption is hugely different um, around the world and um, by nation. And that kind of gives you a sort of indication that where, where the starting point may be for development of an industry, in, in this case, nations of Africa. Many of the African nations that are probably online here are, are likely to be in sort of category E or maybe D of this, of this chart. Um, and if you want to read more about that, you can look at that in that paper at the bottom, but it will tell you how much seafood is being, is being consumed by people in those nations. And there are five broad types. So that's the sort of setting really, but seafood is consumed differently. And by seafood, I do mean freshwater and marine, marine aquatic animals and, 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 and plants. If you then take that consumption rate and you look at which nations are producing seafood and, and, and other fish types of fish from aquaculture, you can also type those countries into five major types. Those nations which are on blue on this, on this table on the map are nations which produce more than what they need per person, um, their, their, per, their, their sort of annual per capita consumption rate in the nation from aquaculture. So maybe the 20 kilos and they make 25 kilos per person from aquaculture. So they're producing more than they uh, need per person. And at the bottom of the table, the type five nations um, produce less than 5% of their national per capita seafood demand from aquaculture. So they're consuming seafood, but they produce very little of that from the aquaculture sector. They're more reliant on wild capture fisheries or imports. And if you look at that on the map, there's sort of a geographical presentation. You can see that many of those nations, um, the sort of the red nations there are, are in Africa. So those nations are consuming seafood of different types, but at the moment are not producing very much of that from aquaculture, despite some of the growth rates that Colin mentioned in his previous presentation. So it really shows you there's a huge potential there for those nations to develop um, seafood security around an increase of aquaculture production in, the, in their own nation. We've been talking a lot about um, sustainability and Colin mentioned that in his, previous, in his previous presentation. What we're really keen on, I guess, in, in DEFRA and CFAS and, and, our, and our work overseas is to acknowledge the fact that any food sector and aquaculture is no different, will have sustainability issues. And what we're proposing is that, you know, really we need to be thinking about that up front and designing sustainability as much as we can into those sectors that we want to see develop. And if you look at uh, a, a, you know, a region such as Africa, 
And he looked at that, that context of much more production could and will occur in the next number of years. Wouldn't it be a great time now to build those sustainability metrics into the sector from scratch rather than having to sort of retrofit them onto a sector that's got very large? And sustainability, you know, if you, if you look at it across the board, it, there's lots of publicity around aquaculture and issues with sustainability from fish farm escapes to sort of bonded labour within, within some markets to disruption of mangroves to overuse of antibiotics, et cetera. These are all things that we know about and can do something about if indeed we design evidence policy and legislation into a system to allow those things to be controlled. So they're all, we can deal with all of them if we, if we acknowledge them and, and build them in from, from the start. Um, we've been talking about One Health has been a really good way of doing that. One Health, you probably are familiar with the phrase of One Health and how it's used. It's normally used in a, a sort of veterinary or medical context. And things like COVID are a good example of a One Health issue where you have a sort of spillover from the environment. It goes into humans and it lands on a, on a population and, and manifests in different ways. But what I'd like to say is that you know, One Health is not just about zoonotics. It, it can be applied much more broadly. And it's also something that really needs to be pointed at a specific issue. So what we're proposing here is that aquaculture is a good place to point One Health at and design some of those sustainability metrics into it from the outset. Um, so One Health is an approach and not a subject. If someone asks you, do you work in One Health or on One Health? The answer is yes. You don't have to be a vet or a medic or someone working on disease to be a, a One Health, um, adding your expertise to One Health. Um, it needs to be applied and can be applied to a particular issue or subject or a desired outcome, in this case, a sustainable aquaculture sector or industry. And what we have to acknowledge is that a wide range of input will be needed. It will go beyond the specialist in aquaculture to make aquaculture work sustainably within a nation. You may need, uh, you know, may need a much, much wider array of people to be inputting into that to, to be able to do that. So that's where the One Health Aquaculture concept comes in. You can read about it more in, in, these, in this paper. And also um, there's a sort of collection of papers that are building up around this topic, which you can have a look at in, in Nature Food. And really what we're saying there is that you've got this, um, this shared desire, in this case shown by this blue wheel around the outside of sustainable aquaculture. That could be at the national level, it could be at the regional level. And working with colleagues who are experts in environmental health, in organism health, um, seaweed health, um, human health, you can then um, decide upon the set of success metrics around the outside of this wheel that you would like to see designed into your sector. And to understand what research, evidence, policy and legislation will be needed to achieve that success metric. So I mentioned I'm a pathologist. I have an interest in keeping animals alive in in aquaculture scenarios. Um, there could be um, sort of pathology involved with that. It could be molecular diagnostics, et cetera, et cetera. So my bit of this wheel would be probably organism success metric one in the yellow section there. And there you can measure research evidence policy and legislation in place to control for that particular metric. But I'm certainly not an expert in gender equality or how to create equitable income from aquaculture how to make um, you know, colleagues have pride in their employment and have good incomes. I'm not an expert in how to protect biodiversity and natural capital around farms or how to ensure that there's high genetic integrity in the farm stock, et cetera. So you can see how to do this one health approach properly, you need to bring in a wider array of expertise to help for that to happen. So that's how the one health aquaculture approach works. And it really gives you a sort of checkpoint against these metrics. How well are we doing? How well, how should we be building research evidence and policy into that part of our, of our desire to create a sustainable agriculture sector in our nation? So One Health Agriculture means applying a One Health approach to consider that those wide ranging metrics that we, that we agree are desirable for a sustainable sector. We engage a more diverse range of expertise in, in, in outside of those just who work on or in agriculture. So we need specialists in other things not just those in the policy space or evidence space of aquaculture. Um, that, there's a much wider array of people needed for that, and we have to open ourselves up to that. Aquaculture is, 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 a, is a sector and not a subject. So um, just like agriculture, um, it would be strange for having to see people working 
on or in agriculture. I think we need to move our narrative back up to the same space. It really needs to be seen as a food sector that, that um, brings in those people. Um, we can measure the achievement and deployment of those metrics over time. And we need to be very adaptable to considering how aquaculture interacts with other food sectors. It doesn't act independently. It absolutely links to land-based sectors as well. Um, and we need to understand those interactions better. So that's what one health aquaculture means. Um, but what we're saying at CFAS really is you, you often can't do all of those things around that wheel simultaneously. And what we are sort of, um, I guess, pushing for is a, a real focus on increased animal health and food safety to be built into aquaculture as very initial early elements. If you can't keep um, organisms alive in farms and you can't consume them, then essentially you're using up large amounts of human and environmental capital to create no tangible outcome in terms of food or income. And in that case, you've created a very unsustainable food sector um, that, that won't, won't survive. So concentrating on some of these really key elements of aquaculture are going to be really critical in terms of expanding the sector in many African nations, as, as, as Colin was mentioning. Um, the scenarios for aquaculture, as you know, are very diverse. So aquaculture is not one thing. It can be everything from farming eucumatoid seaweeds to large scale shrimp production to these amazing offshore facilities where fish are um, in these enclosed, you know, um, sort of towns, if you like, which are which are floating 200 miles offshore, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a really diverse sector and we need to understand all the scenarios. And by scenario, we don't just mean the product. We mean where the product is made, who is making it, where the intended market is for that. Is it for home consumption? Is it for export? If it's for export, who will consume it and how will it be consumed? Will it be cooked? Will it be raw? Will it be made into other products? And those sorts of scenarios need to be really well understood in terms of managing some of the hazards and the barriers to production that may occur in those sectors. You also need to have a very good understanding of the supply chain. Those hazards interact very differently at different stages. So pathogens may be interacting very much with the early life and grow out stages. Um, toxins could be interacting with harvest. So algal toxins, which are blooming in farms at the time of desired harvest, could spoil a harvest or prevent you from harvesting. During the processing, you can have the introduction of other hazards, such as foodborne hazards and so on. And some of those hazards collectively will stop you trading a product. If listed diseases are present, you might not be able to export that product to your desired market. And finally, in the consumption phase, other hazards interact, which make the product unsafe to consume. So hazards interact right the way through this process. And what we're proposing really in the One Health approach is to really take a careful look at that. So as well as building aspirations for volumetric increase in production, you must also build in ways in which we can control these hazards through the process to get to that end product that we are all wanting to be produced, which is food and, and, and income. Um, to do that, we've, we've started to take what we call a, a one, a one hazard, you know, an all hazards approach. Um, it's not sufficient anymore for just people like myself to work on single viral pathogens of interest. Uh, Colin mentioned there about you know, microbiomes and understanding microbial consortia that are in ponds that may impact on one health. That's becoming a really important way of, of looking at um, future aquaculture. Chasing health rather than chasing disease is going to become a really important thing to do. Big data, how do you understand health of ponds? That's really important. But also to understand how these pathogens interact with other hazards in, the, in that environment. Pollutants, metals, organic pollutants, radiochemicals, biotoxins and algal blooms, use of pharmaceuticals, antimicrobial agents, et cetera. What are they doing to production and what are they doing to that supply chain? And finally, what human pathogens, you know, vibrios, noroviruses, hepatitis viruses, um, other zoonotics, how are they interacting with our desired supply chain and stopping us doing what we're intending to do, which is make food? So really important to understand those hazards and and to build in their control into our desire to grow volume is going to become really important. And this is the second paper in, the, in this sort of One Health series also has a look at that. It defines the scenario 
that we're looking to do, maybe to grow those oysters in that bay for export to the European Union for consumption raw. That could be a scenario. Um, there will be a, a set of hazards, customized hazards, which associate with the supply chain of that. We can look at what the uncontrolled risk, if we do nothing to control that, what would happen? We can then apply a risk mitigation matrix to take away, reduce those hazards interacting at different supply phases, hopefully shrinking down the risk of that production and then creating a decision to progress for that sector or to amend it and go back around again and change the scenario, maybe a different location, maybe a different seafood product, maybe a different way of consuming it. So we really need to be building this risk mitigation matrix into our desire to grow this sector in Africa and everywhere else. So I recommend having a quick look at that paper if you're interested in this type of thing. And um, just to, I've asked to make a comment about the, the One Half Agriculture Workshop we just finished um, a couple of weeks ago, um, the colleagues from KTN attended. And I, I think I'll just summarise here some of the key messages and, and, and they're no different to really the ones that Colin um, previously said. You know, agriculture has a huge potential to support human well-being via food security and trade um, in Africa. Um, and, and we heard very, very loud and clear that engagement of youth and, and attention to gender is very critical. Um, African nations often have quite a young population. It's really engaging those people with high tech and, and, and some very attractive approaches. They want to be involved with high technologies. They want to be learning the new techniques and applying those to these sectors. Is going to be really important to do. Um, the, the sector is very diverse, freshwater to seawater, inverts to fish, plants and seaweeds, integrated systems. It's not one thing. We need to be really thinking about what's going to work within different nations and how, how to make the best of that, especially in relation to the hazards that may be there. How do we minimise those hazards down? Low-cost technologies will be required to unlock potential. Um, it won't always be possible to have those really high tech approaches like some of the salmon farming approaches, for instance, in every nation, in every location. So we, it needs to be fit for purpose. Um, specialist functions are going to be needed, hazard identification, diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccine systems, etc., will be needed. But what we're hearing is that individual nation to nation to nation expertise may not always be possible and a regional approach may be better in some cases. And I saw, you know, Colin was talking about that kind of hub approach is, is potentially quite a good way of doing that. That certainly exists in other locations, even in Europe with European Union reference labs, et cetera. So that's a tried and tested model to provide that expertise within sort of regional hubs rather than every, repeated in every nation. And really importantly, public-private partnership models are going to be needed. Um, some of the sustainability metrics will absolutely have to be owned by industry, but some will absolutely have to be owned by government. So creation of high water quality in which to do aquaculture is potentially a really strong government public good that has to be bought into by the governments wishing to grow the sector in their own nation. Um, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Um, that's where I, I, I come from with CFAS. We've got this healthy seafood theme, two centers of excellence around keeping things alive and safe food. There's three designations within that for the OIE and the FAA, you can see there. And we have a um, close link to a sustainable agriculture future centre in Exeter, but also the wider UK academic offering is, is very, very strong in this space. And um, we're open to collaboration, so we'll be happy to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grant. Um, that was a great introduction to One Health Aquaculture and uh, feedback from uh, the workshop a few weeks ago. Um, so next up, we have uh, Dr. Mags Crumlish, um, and a PhD student who's a PhD student at the University of Stirling, working with Mags. Um, Aloysius Adibi. So Mags is a senior lecturer in aquatic food security in the Institute of Aquaculture. She's a microbiologist studying bacterial pathogenesis, aquatic disease diagnosis and antimicrobial resistance. She's currently leading projects investigating infectious diseases occurring in farmed catfish, tilapia, warm water shrimp and salmon. And Aloysius is a PhD student investigating improved biosecurity practices for Nigerian aquaculture. So I'll pass over to you, Mags. Thanks very much, Caroline. I'll just share my screen.
hopefully you can see that and hear us fine. So thank you very much for your uh, in, in, excellent introduction. Uh, my name is Max Cromlish and I'm going to be joined by Aloysius. I'm from the Institute of Aquaculture. And just in case you're not familiar with the Institute of Aquaculture, we are part of the University of Stirling. And as you can see in the map here, we are right in the centre between Edinburgh and Glasgow. The research that we do is we, we like to think about research with impact. Now, we were established just about 50 years ago as a unit of aquatic pathobiology, and we have grown over that time. And you can see on the slide the academic staff, the support staff, students that we have. We are research and teaching. That is what we try to do. Uh, we try to do this under several different themes associated with aquaculture. Now, in those themes, we are really under the broad themes that Colin mentioned this morning. We're thinking about the health and welfare of the animals and production. We're looking at production systems. We're looking at genetics, reproduction, nutrition of aquaculture animals. And we're also looking at supply chains. We're looking at value chains, environmental and societal issues. And later on in today, the presentation, another PhD student, uh, Alex Pounds, is going to be talking about a different side of the research that we do. So in terms of some of the challenges, when we were thinking about this, and I guess it has been mentioned by both Grant and Colin this morning, that disease challenges continue to be relevant to the development of aquaculture globally. And we know that there are economic, social, and environmental impacts. It's just been well described by Grant in the One Health aspect and One Health approach. One of the challenges we have in terms of the disease side is that it, there's very few clinical signs of disease. Animals have clinical signs. They don't have symptoms because they can't tell us how they feel. And so when we think about it, we look for clinical signs, which are abnormalities. Very few of these are actually pathonomic within the fish. So in other words, we're not able to be able to look at an animal and say exactly what's there. And that's one of the big challenges we have, which means that there is a continued reliance on the need for more traditional approaches integrated with the more advanced systems that have already been mentioned this morning. So I'm thinking here, in terms of disease diagnosis and pathogen identification. Now, fortunately, um, we're in a session that's quite early this morning. So when I show you some grotty pictures of fish, I'm gonna apologize in advance for this, but this is kind of what we do in the disease side. And as a bacteriologist, I generally work on the bacterial diseases of fish. And what you can see on the screen here is this is a typical presentation of a group, uh, uh, Gram positive bacteria called Streptococcus agalacti in tilapia. And you can see here we've got stress induced skin ulceration in a clarious species down the bottom. So these are very easy to see. However, this is not always the case in some of the production systems. When you're working with thousands of animals, it can be quite challenging. And when we think about the diseases, we often describe them as things that we know about. So this is existing diseases. We think about emerging diseases, which may simply be the presentation of a disease that we already know about in a new location. We also talk about re-emerging infections. And again, I think that's something that's relevant as an industry or as a sector is developing, is that something that perhaps was not well recognized originally is categorized as re-emerging infection. And this is often related to an increase in prevalence, an increase in reporting of the infection itself, not necessarily that the disease has never been there. There's lots of lessons as we intensify the production, there's lots of lessons that we could learn from other countries and certainly from other sectors. And we know that a lot of the fish losses, particularly in the production side are due to infections, but we really have to be a little bit careful here because not everything that results in a mortality or a morbidity event is a pathogen. It's not all pathogen driven. So we really have to factor in, again, following on from what Grant said just a few seconds ago about the whole environmental side, thinking about the human side, you know, where are some of these challenges that we have that end up becoming infectious diseases? How much of these are anthropogenic? So just to give you an example of some of the research that we are involved in that 
is relevant to the species that we've talked about already. In the Institute of Aquaculture, we are very focused on interdisciplinary and international research. We have a very strong portfolio in both of these fields. So although we're in the centre of Scotland, which is famous for its salmonid aquaculture, we actually do a huge amount of international research. If I look at the ones that we're in, we are involved in at the moment, and these are some of the projects that I'm leading, so we can see they've got the streptococcus. So if you are working with tilapia, you probably have come across this uh, disease. We've got several projects looking at the disease pathogenesis here. And we're part of this large uh, group B streptococcus network, which is looking at these novel sequence types. And you can see here on the slide here, this picture here of the tilapia, you can see it's got its eye on the left hand side here. You can see it's cloudy, there's ocular uh, opacity there. And then you can see this next to this is the risk profile. This just came out uh, this, uh, this year. This was a FAO document. We're a large group of people looking at how we can use multiple approaches to really help and understand the disease risks within this particular um, bacterial challenge. We're also looking at catfish and tilapia species that are being produced in Indonesia. And again, we're using a multiple methods here. We're looking at traditional disease diagnosis and surveillance. And this is with a PhD student uh, who's supervised by myself, uh, Jimmy Turnbull and Andrew Dubois at the Institute of Aquaculture. And you can see here, this is a typical presentation on the catfish here, where we've got presentation of ulcers and some hemorrhaging in here. And it's easy to miss this in the farms. And so what we're trying to do here is really understand what the prevalence is of actual infectious diseases and what those diseases are. So we're using multiple tools, including some of the genomic methods that have already been mentioned this morning. And before I move on to Aloysius, who really is the star of this presentation because he's doing his PhD in relation to uh, Nigerian aquaculture, I wanted to just talk about how some of the projects that we have to find mitigation or to really find efficacious solutions can take some time, but it is achievable. And here I've got, we've got a project here which is sponsored by the um, IDRC funded project. Now this is a large uh, international project with Vietnamese partners. We also have a commercial partner called Aqualife in here. The purpose of this project is really to look at solutions to antimicrobial resistance. And this is because unfortunately in Vietnam, many of the bacterial diseases that affect the Asian catfish species, Pangaceus, Hypo, Pangaceanodon hypophthalmus, are now 100% resistant to all of the antibiotics. And so it's really critical that they have an alternative solution, which they do actually have but the farmers don't really want to use it. And this is what a big part of this project's about. It's not just about producing novel new vaccines. It's not just about how we road test machine vaccination. This is all fantastic science, but how do we get people to use the products in the right way that are required so we can actually see the impact of some of this innovation and so back in 2000, we first identified the disease and you can see the timeline of all the interventions that we've tried to put in place. And I'm really hopeful and I hopefully will share with you some of these results at the end of this project in 2023 that we, fingers crossed, we have more catfish farmers actually using the vaccine. So I'll hand over to Aloysius now. Hi. Yeah, my name is Aloysius Adibe. I'm a PhD student. I've already been introduced, registered in the Institute of Agriculture here in the University of Stirling. I'm working on improving uh, disease management practices in farmed African catfish. At Clara Grappinus as the species I'm going to use. My, uh, my work is being sponsored by the tertiary education transfer of the Nigerian government. And I'm under the supervision of uh, Dr. Manx, Professor Jimmy, and uh, Professor Simon. The first part of my work, um, the overall, the overall um, aim of the work I'm doing is to provide evidence-based solution to support improved disease uh, management in freshwater aquaculture, especially in Nigeria, and which can also be um, 
um, implemented in every other part of the world. So what I'm doing, I'm going to combine I'm combining both laboratory-based uh, methods and then uh, particle-based uh, fish uh, fish uh, farm-based method that are going to uh, be used to implement the uh, biosecurity plans that we are trying to develop. And to do this, we are testing some um, disinfectants which are used to reduce the bacterial load in in our culture system. So we are we have tried to. Uh, there's so many of the disinfectants against uh, some bag, um, bacteria that are relevant to aquaculture in Nigeria. So what you can see here is um, what uh, we have done with the isopropanol against uh, Aeromonas hydrophila and different concentration of the, of the isopropanol at different time series. So we can see that uh, there is a reduction in the microbial load across um, from zero to 30 minutes then to one hour. And this shows that the, the bacterial load is being reduced by the disinfectant. So we are going also to have a, a, um, a particle-based um, um, work where we are going to implement uh, what we have done in the laboratory to make sure that they fit into what the farmers can use. So the second part of my uh, work will be to um, improve the, the immune, immunity of the fish against uh, these uh, infectious organisms. So we are going to um, produce a bacteria vaccine, which will be introduced into the fish. And then we are going to take um, tissues, blood, and plasma from the fish to look at the development of the cat, uh, immune system of the catfish. So the work we are doing with the catfish is uh, something that is little is known much about, not, not much known about the immune response of the catfish. So we are doing a very fundamental and uh, something that can be applied very effectively in our culture industry. So we are going to uh, produce the vaccine and then look at the, how the immune system of the catfish develops, and then after the vaccine introduction, at different uh, time um, of, the, of the vaccine in the fish, then we're going to look at how the fish is responding, the immune of the fish is responding to the, the vaccine, and how it has, the vaccine has helped to improve the immunity of the fish, and then so that the fish will be able to survive and find um, the infectious organisms in, in the aquaculture system. So what I work, my work I'm doing is to first of all, look at the biosecurity measures that can be implemented in the, in the system to screen infectious organisms from entering to the farm. And then also to use some improved hygiene practices to stop the circulation or the spread of infectious organisms between systems in the farm and then get a vaccine that can help the fish to withstand the, the, the effect of infectious organisms in case of their presence in the aquaculture system. So that is the overall thing I'm going to do in this work. So I am going to make sure that the, what we're going to produce is something that the farmers can implement in, in their systems. So I'm going to hand over back to Dr. Max to finish up the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aloysius. So as part of the introduction here to the Institute of Aquaculture, um, as well as the research that we're doing, we thought, what was the opportunities here? And the opportunities here is that we are very research active already in several different African countries. We are only showcasing some of the work that our colleagues and ourselves are involved in. So please do contact us, please do keep in touch with us. We are open to a wide range of collaboration, particularly in the animal health sector, the supply chains and environmental impacts. Now, being part of a university, we have a very strong track record in supporting education. 
And we're particularly keen to support the education-based initiatives, some of which have been showcased this morning. And on the slide here, I've put a couple of examples. We have very, uh, we have three MSc programs here. You can see in sustainable aquaculture, aquatic pathobiology and aquatic veterinary studies. We have a very large alumni, some of who I have seen are already on this, this, uh, on this call today. So it's great because we keep in touch, very strong uh, alumni there. We also provide CPD programs. So these are a continued professional development. We have one that's established for salmonids and we're looking to expand this further into tilapia and other species. Now, it would be remiss of me not to mention the city regional deal, which is a 17 million pound investment in the Institute of Aquaculture, where we're looking at um, several aspects here. It started, really, it started this year. And this is a fantastic opportunity for us to um, showcase what we can do and to support collaboration. The initial part of the investment will support the National Aquaculture Technology and Innovation Hub, and you can see an architectural drawing here of what this might look like. This will be a state-of-the-art aquarium, and then we'll follow on with the state-of-the-art uh, laboratory facilities. It does say national because it is a national in the UK, but since it's not national in terms of the species, we will have more capacity to be able to do warm water uh, species than ever before. We really do pride ourselves on taking a global approach to our research and our teaching. So please do contact us if you're interested in collaborating um, at all in any of the aspects. And if there's something you are interested in that I haven't shared this morning, please do let us know. It just takes me to say thank you very much for your attention and I will stop sharing now. Thank you. Thank you, Mags and Aloysius. That was uh, great, really interesting work that you're doing and great to hear that you're keen to collaborate uh, with people. So um, do get in touch with Mags and Aloysius if, you, if you'd like to collaborate. So we are running slightly behind time. So um, hopefully we will be able to still have a break, but we might reduce it slightly um, after Harrison. So we have Harrison Juma coming up, um, who is, as I mentioned earlier, um, a change from what we originally had in the agenda. But Harrison is general manager at Tunga Nutrition. He's an animal nutritionist by training with over 16 years experience in the East African animal nutrition industry, comprising a unique blend of expertise in plant and production operations, along with general and specific technical knowledge on poultry, dairy, swine and aquaculture. So um, Harrison, if I could ask you to share your slides. That's uh, great. And uh, over to you. If you, you are on mute, Harrison. Um, hello, everyone. I hope that you can hear me. If yes. Good. Can you hear me, Caroline? Yes, that's great. We can hear you answer your slide. Thanks, Harrison. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, as introduced, uh, my name is Harrison Juma. I work for Tunga Nutrition, um, Kenya Limited. Uh, Tunga Nutrition is part of the uh, Unga Group, a public listed company in, in Kenya, uh, dealing with human nutrition, but also uh, uh, animal nutrition as well. So, Tunga Nutrition is the newest baby uh, in the family. And it's only looking at aquafeeds, um, so basically nutrition and solutions uh, towards a, our aqua farmers. Just to uh, dive deeper into that, um, we've over the years been working very closely with Nutreco International um, at the Unga Group level, um, supplying us with uh, some technical know-how, but also products uh, that we use in our animal nutrition business. Um, 2017, uh, through a consortium, Foodtech Africa, uh, we ventured into, this is Asgunga now, into Aquafits production, uh, producing a brand of uh, Aquafits called Fugo. Um, so very quickly, we ran out of capacity uh, based on the demand of uh, feeds uh, in the region. So of course, uh, working with Nutreco, we knew that the next level for us to quickly 
increase capacity, but also technical know-how and you know be able to support our farmers. Uh, we knew the only thing to do then was to um, you know uh, bring that partnership to the next level. So uh, as of first of February this year, we got into a joint venture. So 50-50% uh, shareholding between Unga Group and Nutreco. And we are producing aquafids. Of course, we still produce the Fugo brand, which is uh, owned by Unga. And specifically, this goes to our small scale farmers. And then, you know, the large scale farmers, uh, we are supplying them with a scratching, scratching, scratching brand. Of course, the other uh, objective was to also quickly increase the production capacity. So as I speak, we are working on tripling our current capacity, which should come online uh, towards the end of this towards the end of this calendar year. Um, so as a snapshot, um, if you look at what Unga is producing for uh, animal feeds, which also gives a very good indication of what um, the split of the different species um, in the region look like. You can see the biggest portion is poultry, about 64%. Then dairy, swine, and aqua, as you can see, is only two only 2%. But, you know, if you look at how efficient uh, these other species are in converting um, materials into protein sources for human consumption, of course, we will all agree that fish, uh, fish is the most efficient, efficient there. So, it, you know, we'd like to uh, invert this uh, pie chart so that we're producing more fish feed. Um, and I think that's where we are headed to. In the region, uh, the most dominant species uh, of fishes that we produce, uh, tilapia is, is biggest. Of course, we do catfish as well, about 17%. In there is a zero point something of uh, trout uh, and shrimps as well. There are a few other species, but uh, not of economic uh, significance. Now, if we dive deeper and look at the feed resources available for our farmers, uh, for a very long time, um, you know, farmers, especially those are, that are large scale uh, and commercial oriented, they've been importing uh, feeds uh, for lack of, uh, you know, available good quality and cost effective feeds uh, in the region. So I'm talking periods before uh, 2015, 2017. And they, you know, uh, imported feeds are obviously characterized by, you know, their top quality. So these are feeds. Uh, produced by the likes of Scratching and, and other global brands out there. Uh, farmers look at them as not being cheap, but we know that they are cost effective because of what you'll be able to get um, from those feeds. Of course, you have logistical challenges if you have to bring these feeds from um, Europe, for example, or North Africa or South America. You have all those challenges of how fast you can be able to bring these feeds in. Uh, and because of that, people have to keep very huge stocks, which ties down their capital and, you know, limits their ability to expand. Um, yeah, and, um, you know, most of these uh, parts where most of these fields are produced, they have access to raw materials, a good quality, but also uh, cost effective as well as they put them into their formulations. So if you look on the other hand, local production, um, because now we are able to produce a extruded a pellet feed, which is what you want for tilapia so that they can be able to float. There is one other, I think, person that's able to produce that as well. Um, so the, the, the idea there is to match uh, the, the quality of the feeds that are being, being imported. However, we still have people within the region that produce only you know, pellets. Uh, we know that tilapia um, are surface feeders, so you want a floating pellet, but you have people that produce your normal pellets like you're doing for um, broiler feeds, for example. And it's all because of the, the equipment is unavailable or where it's available, it's expensive. Um, you have challenges with things to do with formulation and nutritional know-how. Um, and of course, the raw material availability as well affects what can be able, can be able to be produced. But we also have <laughs> on the very low end people that still produce uh, marsh feeds and feed them to um, to fish. Of course, if you talk to them, they will tell you that um, they are cheap. 
Uh, whether that is actually true is debatable. We know from a technical angle that, you know, um, when someone says cheap, it's how many shillings you pay per kilo or per ton. But you will realize that half of that feed or more than half of that feed is not consumed by the fish. It sinks, it goes to datify your pond and your environment. Uh, of course, you know, technical know-how uh, around formulations and nutrition is, 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 is also lacking. And so those feeds are not, are not ideal. So the challenge we have is to move the people doing mashes and those doing not floating pellets to see the value in uh, using uh, top quality feeds and not just look at the price per bag, but what you get um, at the end. So um, this aqua plant was commissioned in 2017, like I have mentioned. <clears throat> then it was under UNGA. Now uh, with the JV, it's, it's owned by Tunga Nutrition Kenya Limited. And, and um, today we're doing about just below two tons an hour. It's not a big plant, uh, but the plans we have in place is to triple that by the end of the year, uh, like I said. Now, um, if you look at the things that are um, challenges uh, from a feed processing, feed production, a point of view. Um, and this is information based on what we've seen as Bunga and Tunga. It might be a little bit different from different uh, parts of the world based on raw material availability and price. But uh, we all know what has happened uh, with uh, protein sources, um, especially in the last three uh, to four years. Um, so, for example, in 2018, uh, the cost of protein in the formulation was about 60%. It's moved now to 70%. I don't think that we have a big, big challenge with energy sources, the likes of cereals and fats and oils. Uh, that's not too, uh, too bad of a problem at the moment. So, ideally, um, if we costed our feeds based on where we've come from, where raw materials were available and we didn't have all these challenges with soy and things like this, then your protein cost in the formulation was about 50%. Uh, 50 and we believe it should actually be, be lower than that. So essentially, this presents the industry with a problem because we know feed is the biggest cost component uh, in aquaculture production. And we would like uh, to bring it to a cost that is as manageable as possible uh, to the farmer. So what can we be able to do? Of course, from um, the table on the left, uh, protein is the critical thing that we need to be looking at. Uh, those that have um, some information around what's happening in East Africa, um, in Kenya specifically, we are not allowed to use any GM materials. And, um, you know, when we go out there looking for uh, where we can be able to buy soya bean meal or soya beans, because we, we, we also uh, installed a soya processing plant. So when we look um, at the markets where we can be able to get these materials and we insist on GM free, initially the government was saying we should be able to bring 99.9% uh, .9 GM free uh, soyas or products into this country. And it was almost impossible. So the more stringent we are, the higher the price. Of course, it being an GM is already too expensive compared to a GM soil. But um, the more we are stricter, the more expensive it gets. So there are discussions to see whether the government can, you know, lock some of those rules so we can be able to bring in GM soil. For us, this is a big, big one. And we estimate that we can bring down the overall cost of it by between 15 and 20 percent if you're allowed to bring in GM. Um, yeah, for our soya plant, if we can be able to get local production of soya beans, of course, our main sources are still within the region. So Uganda, uh, those that are familiar with East Africa, we bring quite a bit from Zambia as well. Um, you know, we're trying to encourage farmers to produce uh, soya beans locally so we can reduce the cost of this. We have worked with uh, other projects uh, looking at uh, novel protein uh, sources for animal feeds. And um, in a list of about 40 or so ingredients that we were investigating, the project is not quite um, concluded yet. Uh, insect protein was coming in um, at the top there, and uh, specifically black soldier flies. Um, yeah, at the moment, there isn't a lot of uh, 
this uh, product in terms of volumes. There are quite a number of people that have gotten into uh, trying to produce this. The challenge we face is uh, the initial cost before scaling up. Uh, the price is quite high, it's prohibitive. Uh, it actually doesn't fit in the formulations, but we know uh, if such um, entities scale up, then the price of a black soldier fly could come down to a place where it will be able to compete with, with, with other protein sources. And we think this is a very uh, high potential product. So working closely with um, you know anyone that's doing that out there um, so that we can see how we can help it, each other. Um, importation of uh, animal protein, poultry meal, meat and bone meal, this kind of products from elsewhere. Um, apart from East Africa, we have all these restrictions about a uh, mud cow disease and it's, um, it's not good, but um, um, that's where we are in terms of raw material cost. Um, now, once you have produced the feed and it's already with all those challenges around raw material, so the price we know it's not where it's supposed to be. You have now an issue of getting it to where uh, it needs to be consumed. Now, we have two categories of customers. <clears throat> The big guys, which we call uh, our key accounts, there are only a handful of these uh, in, in the region, but they command like 80% of our total sales. So such people are able to you know, sit down with us and we can have discussions and we can see um, you know, volume discounts and things like that. Uh, and they're able to get feeds at reasonably discounted prices compared to uh, the small scale, small scale farmers. Now, the small scale farmer gets feeds at the most expensive because for it to reach where they are and they're buying you know so many bags a week it has to go through the whole channel so from our factory to a distributor to a stockist and hence they're able to buy the feed very expensively and you know their cost of production is slightly higher and their margins are, are, are smaller and, and what we've tried to do is to ask these farmers to come together in groups so that we can be able to supply them. <clears throat> we negotiate volume discounts and logistics delivering to them becomes also easy, but it's also easy to reach them if they're in groups to offer technical support, uh, things to do with water quality, stocking density, uh, health, all, all these things. If, if they're in groups, it becomes a little bit easier for, for, for us. Um, you will probably also know that for, 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 for Kenya, for example, in the, in the 80s, um, early 80s, late 80s, we used to have extension services um, offered by the government. That's no longer there now. They've been devolved to the county government, but they have lots of um, things that they need to streamline. Um, you know, and they're simple things like mobility of these people to be able to visit. Uh, farmers. So what we do as feed producers is we have our own teams um, that work with these farmers or work with our distributors to see that we help uh, we help these farmers to have the best husbandry, but also get the best out of out of the feeds. Uh, the challenge is we cannot be everywhere. Uh, we only have a limited uh, number of people. So again, working in groups makes it a lot easier for us to be able to help them. Um, yeah. Um, I've talked a lot about technical know-how uh, on the feed side, but also now on the farmers uh, side. We have, especially small-scale farmers, you go to a um, fish farm and they have so many ponds and you start asking questions around uh, even simple things like stocking density, um, how many, you know, fishes are in the pond, how much feed they are giving per day. and records bookkeeping these things are, are, are lacking so it's something that uh, we know we need to work with these farmers to ensure to bring them to a level where they can be able to be profitable and hopefully grow uh, grow to 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 you know medium scale uh, towards the large scale again the solution here is to try and bring them into groups so that we can uh, be able to support them um, the feed millers themselves, I, I, uh, earlier on I talked about uh, people producing uh, normal pellets and feeding them into uh, to fish, uh, producing mash feeds and feeding them to fish. And if you talk to these people, of course, there's the issue of cost, but um, 
formulation and nutrition support missing quality assurance not a lot of these people have labs or access um, to labs to test their raw materials uh, to test the products that they have produced to see that it actually meets uh, the specifications that they have set out to do we do have the bureau of standards that regulates um, um, standards or quality of feeds that are sold into the market again they are not everywhere in the market to see that uh, all the feeds that are on the shelf actually do meet minimum specifications. So some feeds that are poor quality uh, find their way into fish farms and, 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 and you know, it doesn't help. It doesn't help. Of course, um, extrusion technology, it's not cheap the equipment itself, but also how you um, are able to extrude feed at the quality that is expected um, is, is not an easy thing as well. So uh, there is a gap, there is a gap there. Um, yeah, we have a practical experience side to hire um, uh, technical sales people to uh, work with our distributors and help our farmers in the field. And what we find um, coming from our universities is far below what we expect to to get in terms of what they have gone through in their training. So we've uh, deliberately talked to uh, universities to try and, you know, influence a curriculum development um, so that we get people coming of the university, out of universities with uh, the necessary skills that we need for them to be able to work uh, in the industry. We also working with the universities to have um, students coming in for internships um, not just on the sales and technical side, but also on uh, production as well of feed so that we can uh, help to improve the industry. Um, yeah, that's what I had for you. I hope it gives an overview of uh, uh, how the East African feed industry is, uh, but also the challenges that are out there. There are a lot more challenges, I promise you, more than this, but I just picked the few to uh, give a picture of um, how things how things are. Uh, thank you and back to you Caroline. Thank you Harrison that was great that was a really good introduction to the the challenges and opportunities that the feed industry face. Um, so uh, and thanks again for, for stepping in at the last minute Harrison we really appreciate it. So um, on the agenda we did have a break um, that we were meant to have now, but uh, unfortunately we're running really late, so we don't want to miss any of the talks out because uh, because they're really interesting. And uh, so we're just going to head straight into the case studies. Um, if you have any questions for any of our speakers from this morning, do put them in the the Q and the Q and A uh, in the chat. Uh, some of the speakers will be on the panel later, but hopefully um, Harrison may be able to answer some of your questions if you if you put it in the chat for him. So just now to hand over to Joanna, who's going to introduce um, the producer and research case studies. Thanks, Joanna. Brilliant, thank you Caroline. Um, so my name is Joanna Scales and I'm also um, from Innovate UK KTM and I'll be your chair for the next session. Um, so after that brilliant uh, set of introductions on the broader challenges facing the industry, we're now going to hear six short talks from aquaculture producer focused organisations or projects operating in Africa. Um, hear, hearing really about the challenges that they're facing within their operations and how innovation could support um, in solving these, and also how collaboration is moving their work forwards. Um, so our first speaker is Tembwe Matungu. Um, if you want to begin to share your slides, Tembwe, that would be great. Um, and he is the co-founder of First Wave Group, um, which is Africa's largest um, and only vertically integrated freshwater aquaculture business. Um, and the, their mission really is to address protein food security through the provision of affordable fish that's sustainably produced. Um, over to you, Tamboy. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna. This is a picture from uh, about five uh, five years ago. Um, you know, we do things quite uh, quite differently uh, these days. But uh, you know, as Joanna was saying, my name is Tamboy Mutungu. I'm the uh, co-founder and chairman uh, of First Wave uh, First Wave Group. We are present in uh, Zambia uh, and Uganda, and we've got three businesses. Um, you know, spanning spanning um, uh, fish feed uh, production uh, through fish production uh, in both. Uh, uh, in Zambia, uh, and then uh, fish production in in Uganda, and in Uganda, 
um, you know, we are uh, in Zambia and Uganda, excuse me, we're engaged uh, in activities again, uh, right through uh, production uh, through to retail. I've had as a co-founder and uh, I guess as entrepreneurship goes, uh, which is certainly one of the challenges uh, to, to be spoken of, uh, perhaps not the uh, context for this uh, 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 talk, uh, but uh, I've had various roles within the business, including a CFO, as co-CEO, as CEO, uh, and now transitioning uh, to, to management as we continue to grow and expand. Um, we've been very privileged uh, to have had, um, you know, uh, the opportunity to, to, to grow over time. I think that uh, some of that has been uh, been the fact that we've been in, in, in Zambia, which has been a little bit forgiving, lots of mistakes uh, along the way. Um, I would say that, um, you know, we've come from incorporation in 2011. Uh, we actually only uh, got our, our EIA approval in 2013. So you know, that that took two years, um, and then you know, 2015 started getting a little bit of a little bit of traction uh, as we were producing, but then started to discover uh, discovered uh, challenges along the way uh, that led to led to our evolution. Um, you know, of course, uh, you know, fast forwarding to uh, 2020, uh, we got we got hit by COVID, uh, and uh, you know, as a business, uh, we're uh, basically. Let's call it commissioning uh, our Uganda Uganda site and starting uh, starting Uganda Harvest uh, through the challenges of uh, of, of COVID. There, um, what does our business uh, business look like? Um, yeah, it it looks like a you know a, you know a little bit of um, you know perhaps a, a, you know a, quite expansive in in some respects. Uh, but I do, do want to say that I, th I think that we ended up here not as a matter of strategy, not as a consequence of, um, you know, having gone and got a lot of DFI money uh, up front, actually a lot of our DFI funding, uh, you know, that may have been announced uh, or people might be familiar with, uh, that actually came in 2019. Um, and so that's actually after uh, we had uh, we had already done a lot of the work in in, in building out the business and and proving uh, proving the production system and proving the production production model. Um, and so so actually there was this sort of eight years uh, of slog that that happened before that in order to in order to get uh, to get there. But this is what our business looks like uh, today um, when we think about. Uh, we, you know, when we think about just how we are integrated uh, end to end, uh, right from raw materials uh, through to uh, uh, through to consumers, and I, I think that maybe just to talk about the challenges specifically, and try to go a little bit faster here. Yalelo initially started just with production in mind, so literally just thinking about grow out production on the lake. But I think within you know uh, within a year uh, or two, uh, when Brian and Adam uh, were, were running the business, then they discovered that actually there were there was not enough fingerling production uh, in the country, and so within again, although we hadn't uh, hadn't built out uh, much of the grow outside, uh, ended up with the largest hatchery operation uh, in sub-Saharan Africa in order to feed uh, in order to feed the grow out. We started getting production going, um, and um, you know wanting to deliver this affordable protein to to consumers, but then we found that our resellers and retailers would not pass on the price benefit onto consumers, and so that's how we ended up. Um, you know, uh, uh, in, in retail uh, and in direct to consumer sales uh, so that we could pass the benefit on to, uh, on to consumers with this view or with this, uh, with this belief uh, that protein, uh, number one, uh, should, um, should be affordable, number two, that it should be sustainable, that number three, uh, I guess as agriculture people, we believe that it is a better solution, uh, solution than, than chicken and, and so should be competitive right, uh, as, a, as, a white, um, as, a, as a source of white protein. And all of that is about us uh, continuing to drive down the cost of production, continue to drive down uh, our FCRs, our feed costs, uh, and, the, uh, and the like. What do we see as the opportunities now? I think that, you know, we, we spent the last, you know, decade uh, literally just figuring out the basics. Um, and, you know, we've got the basics, we've got the value chain, we've got everything, you know, working together, it doesn't always work perfectly. Uh, we've got the normal challenges of any, you know, uh, of any business. Uh, in actual fact, you know, I often think that 70 or 80% of our challenges are, are, are business and, um, you know, uh, context related, as opposed to, as opposed to aquaculture, culture related. But we do see 
we do see lots of opportunity uh, in continuing to drive improvement uh, in, in husbandry through the use of things like statistical process control. Uh, and that's, um, you know, I guess within, uh, within our context as a, as a commercial scale operator. But this is, is really just uh, the same fundamentals as just getting the basics right. Um, you know, talking about record keeping and, uh, and the like and being able to understand, uh, understand what's going on and use the data to make, uh, to make decisions. It, it is essentially the same fundamentals uh, as you would have even for a small scale farmer. And then the second thing is on breeding. We haven't, you know, we've uh, definitely maybe onto our fifth generation uh, in, in Zambia, already onto our fourth generation in Uganda. Um, but, you know, they're just really scratching the surface uh, in terms of uh, the opportunity uh, and what we see uh, to, again, continue to drive down our FCRs, drive down our cost of cost of production. We're very excited. And it's been a little bit challenging just over the course of the last, uh, last year coming out of COVID. We're very excited to partner with Select, um, you know, who basically, again, we're talking about the use of technology uh, and applying that uh, to develop local strains uh, of, uh, of fish. And that's, that's something that's also just very important to, important to us uh, is not importing genetics uh, into, um, uh, in, you know, into the local environment, but actually working uh, with what we've got, but accelerating uh, the, uh, the process of development, um, accelerating the process of development Again, uh, by partnering with folks of Select, and this is again where we see lots of opportunity, right, uh, in terms of those sorts of partnership. And then again, lastly, just on nutrition and health. Um, again, you know, we've been privileged to have a partnership with uh, Alaraqua, their global producer based in based in Europe. Uh, but I would also say, you know, without criticism uh, at all, that again, you know, we've not done anything really uh, in terms of uh, nutrition uh, and uh, and health. That you know, you will not find record within our business of large scale trials. Um, you know, on the one hand, and uh, but on the other hand, that just represents significant opportunity for us from an industry perspective to actually follow the. Uh, the, the the poultry industry followed. Last thing, you know, uh, I think that you know as we we see opportunity again, just in in, in figuring out how to get local talent to, to partner with with global global expertise, um, and and finally, again, a lot of talk about financing uh, and. And the like, historically for us, that's been about cages and factories. Uh, but you know, with the rise of VC funding in Africa, how are we taking advantage of digital, right? Uh, and and working uh, with what's happening in that space to support, especially play areas that we would have challenges in, which is really pushing the needle on, on research and development and, and areas that actually catalyze uh, catalyze the industry. And so it's, that's I think a lot about how we actually move the conversation away from business, away from value chain, uh, you know, uh, or supply chain business uh, to uh, to really an ecosystem. Business business. Uh, and that's uh, uh, something that we're continuing to think about. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tango. Um, so our next speaker um, is Alexandra Pounds. Um, Alexandra, do you want to begin to share your um, screen? Um, so Alexandra is joining us from the Institute of Aquaculture at the University of U uh, Stirling in the UK. Um, and her PhD thesis um, is on the effects of declining fisheries on rural nutrition security um, and livelihoods in the context of emerging aquaculture. And it includes um, case studies in, in Kenya, um, which I think we'll hear about today, but also Bangladesh and Myanmar. Um, over to you, uh, Alexandra. Thanks, that's fantastic. Welcome everybody. I'm Alex and I'm speaking on behalf of the Institute of Aquaculture Society Group at the University of Stirling. Today, I'm gonna give you a quick taster of some of our most recent projects. In, in Ghana, Emily Devick developed a black soldier fly hatchery and grow out based on her previous experience in Indonesia. This included training local staff to eventually take over the project. We conducted a series of trials to determine the best substrates, including working with large waste disposal facilities in Accra and market vegetable wastes, examining what processes would be required to make it safe for black soldier fly production. The system was able to produce up to 61% crude protein from 15 day old maggots. And the system produced about 100 kilos per week. And the diluted frass was also used for agricultural fertilizer. The main challenges around, uh, around black soldier fly production was scaling up. As with many black soldier fly operations, grow out isn't really the problem. The tricky part is the hatchery and getting them to breed quickly and prolifically. Separating the substrate from the maggots is also uh, difficult on an industrial scale. Black soldier fly is probably better suited to small scale production of fry and fingerling feed with lower volumes, but higher quality and higher protein feed. 
In this uh, three-year project in Egypt, different methods were trialed for creating temperature gradients in tilapia ponds. This was based on previous work at the University of Stirling showing behavioral prophylaxis in tilapia, which is where fish will choose to swim into warmer water if challenged with a bacterial pathogen, which essentially gives them the equivalent of a fever. In tilapia, offering the fish multiple temperature gradients results in an 80 to 90% survival compared to only a 10 to 20% survival in the control groups. So in this approach, they had tried three different types of modifications to the ponds to create these temperature gradients. Um, they were earthen half hectare tilapia ponds. The first was a small polytunnel over one corner of the pond. The second was a raised bank between two ponds. And the third was a raised platform along one side of the pond. The polytunnel had the best effect, but all of the modifications worked really well and the temperature was significantly higher in the treated ponds compared to the control ponds. We still have questions around the economic trade-offs. So for example, are adjustments to the pond economical for a farmer to do? And how does that compare with other alternatives like antibiotics? Oleg's work in Zambia challenged the standard textbook tilapia production paradigm by introducing polyculture ponds with small wetland species using lessons from Bangladeshi aquaculture ponds. We found that people with ponds with these types of ponds had higher dietary diversity and they were able to grow more diverse crops and vegetables through better water management. But they struggled to grow the large 400 gram tilapia for uh, a number of reasons. When these ponds are stocked with many different smaller fish species, people have a higher diversity of fish throughout the year and they're able to improve their nutrient intake of key micronutrients and fatty acids, enabling them to focus their energies on more profitable livelihoods or other agricultural activities. Ponds are thus a, an excellent source of additional fish, but the role of small dried pelagic species from Zambia's lakes was, was, still, a mar, um, was still a more significant uh, source of nutritional security. Will's projects in Malawi aim to improve fish farmers production and business through intensive practical training and coaching linked to a micro, micro credit scheme. As you can see here, the project was really successful, um, considering that many projects don't manage to make a profit until at least the third year or fourth year. Those that did make a profit made a considerable profit and it was enough to reinvest, their, reinvest into their business. So for example, buying feed for the next six month cycle, more fingerlings or have money left over. In the second three year project, we repeated the same methods, but setting up 15 small HAPA based hatcheries using small concrete tanks. As you can see again, this project was also quite successful. The key learning was that this project was highly selective in terms of who was included in the training. And rather than trying to reach just as many farmers as possible, the project targeted much fewer farmers, but provided more intensive assistance throughout the training and frequent on-site coaching. This, was, this approach was much more successful um, in achieving profitability. NACARDA was a KTN funded project where we conducted a human resources needs assessment of the aquaculture in um, of the aquaculture sector in Sub-Saharan Africa. This included the voices, experiences, and perspectives of those working in the industry, the government, NGOs, as well as academia. We found that people across the industry, regardless of whether they're employees or employee, employers, believed that practical hands-on experience was severely lacking from the education system. Industry in particular stressed a need for short distance learning courses that could be done while working on site. In addition, they noted that when interviewing potential employees, they valued non-technical skills like project management over the technical skills, which could be taught on the job. The important role of mentorship was also highlighted, so we investigated further. We found that mentorship relationships were often formal, originating as student-teacher relationships or boss-employee relationships that continued post-formal uh, beyond the formal uh, relationship. Mentors were driven by altruism, but felt restrained by time. Mentees felt empowered and had a sense of duty towards their mentors. Most mentors helped mentee with technical topics, but also business topics and career guidance. The Sarnissa Network is an open group of people working in aquaculture in Sub-Saharan Africa. It was started and is managed by Will Leshen and has grown to almost uh, 7,000 members who actively post questions and answers about aquaculture and relevant news and publications via email and Facebook. It's a collaborative community and it's an, I think it's an excellent example of knowledge sharing in this sector. 
In this also KTM funded project in Bont, Sierra Leone, we aim to understand the livelihood and food security impacts of women oyster harvesting and marketing. Uh, we also look to understand resource sharing and institutional engagement, develop the research capacity of our partner team SWOMA, and promote SWOMA's reputation within the community as oyster marketing experts. Our previous work with SWOMA had trialed value adding oysters, sauces, um, sticker uh, brands, uh, to, to increase their income and their oyster sales as a convenience product in the market. We found that oyster producers have better food security than non-producers, and that food security of the community as a whole was better during the oyster harvesting season. We also found that contrary, that contrary to local opinions, oyster production was a serious livelihood generating activity that was important both for sub, sub, uh, subsistence and financial reasons. In terms of SWOMA's institution, institutional engagement, we found that informal community-based institutions had higher levels of engagement than more formalized institutions. And um, these informal ones are also perceived positively by the community as effective organizations. Working with these informal community-based institutions will likely be more effective pathways to engagement. We're also working in Cote d'Ivoire, working with a multinational team of British, Ivorian, American, and Brazilian researchers, examining the effect of climate change on the disease schistosomiasis in Cote d'Ivoire and also Brazil. Our focus is on the potential for the sustained control of schistosomiasis through biological control of the intermediate host snails. Last month, our team conducted field work across the southern half of Cote d'Ivoire, surveying fish traders, fishers, and farmers on the possibility of growing snail predators, like shrimps, um, at a commercial scale using aquaculture. The ranges of several potential predator species were also mapped. This groundwork is the first step in evaluating this model of snail control. The next steps will involve trial farms and villages. I'm currently on Lake Victoria, Kenya, working on the nutritional implications of failing fisheries and nascent aquaculture on the food security of fishing communities. As we're just getting started with this, I don't have any results to share with you yet, but please do get in touch if you'd like to learn more about it. While we have an array of other projects in this region, these are currently the most active ones. If you'd like more information on any of these, please do email me and I can connect you with the project lead. The Institute of Aquaculture Society group looks forward to working with you all in the future. Thanks to KTN for organizing this meeting and to you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Uh, for that and um, a really comprehensive list of the range of work that um, selling is, is doing. Um, our next speaker is um, a slight shift. Um, so we're going to be talking about seaweed. Um, so uh, Flower, would you like to begin to share your screen? Um, so Flower Masuya is founder and chairperson of the Zanzibar Seaweed Cluster Initiative. Um, she's been researching seaweed aquaculture for over 30 years. Um, and the initiative is really working with seaweed farmers and small scale processors in innovative farming and value addition, linking them up with research government departments and markets. Um, Flower, over, over to you. Oh. No, I'm, I'm sharing again, it just was doing its own. Say that again, sir, feel free to share. Um, I'm sharing what is happening here. Ah, you just need to switch it into presenter mode and that'll be perfect. You can see me. You can um, see the presentation. Just put, uh, switch it to presenter mode um, so that we can see the full screen. Okay. Um, sorry, I have to do it again. No, that's all right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Is it okay now? That's perfect. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, an initiative called the Zanzibar Seaweed Plus Initiative based in Zanzibar, Tanzania. The, the focus of the Zanzibar Seaweed Plus Initiative is to develop um, seaweed farming uh, and value addition uh, technologies. And why are we doing this? It's because uh, our seaweed industry is facing a challenge of, of one of the main challenges is climate change. Uh, because of climate change, the temperature in the water is increasing. So we are having uh, 
disease and pests in our farms. We have YCS disease, we have epiphytes that are affecting our, our, our industry. So the aim is to really innovate in, in, in this uh, technology development to combat um, diseases and the pests on our, our seaweed industry. And uh, this way it means we are also improving the livelihoods of, of our people. Um, so th let's see these uh, um, technologies that we are developing. We are currently developing uh, technologies to farm the seaweed in, in, in deeper water areas. Um, you know, for now, uh, our farmers are using are farming in shallow water areas where we have a lot of these challenges with diseases. So we want to, to, to we are developing technologies to farm in deep water areas where diseases are less. The aim is to improve, uh, to increase the production of, of, of the seaweed. We are also uh, developing technologies to add seaweed where we have different uh, technologies and recipes of making seaweed products. And uh, it means that our, our, our farmers are making seaweed products and selling. Uh, this way they are improving their livelihoods and the seaweed cluster is uh, um, uh, the one spearheading all of this. Um, but at the same time, we have challenges um, that we are facing now. And uh, these challenges, I have to say that they are challenges we think that they, we, we see that they will continue. For example, we are talking about the challenge of, of climate change. We know that climate change is there uh, and it will, it will continue to be there for some, some years. So. Uh, our main challenge, we are, one of our challenges we are seeing is that we may continue to have these diseases and pests affecting our seaweed industry for some time because of the, the effect of climate change. Uh, so we need to really go into uh, developing technologies to cope with this climate change. We are also seeing that we will continue to have, uh, the, the seaweed production will continue to decrease. Uh, for the last five years, we, the, the, the production is, is decreasing a lot. So. If we do not really come out to say the required technologies to increase production, we might co continue to see uh, our seaweed production uh, decreasing. And also we have limited market for our, 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 our products especially. So um, we have to look into uh, this market. Otherwise we are seeing that the market limit is going to be um, persistent in, in, in our case. But we also have opportunities that we are, we are looking at um, now and in, in, in the future. The opportunities is that we are, we are already having this knowledge of developing um, farming technologies. So it's something that we can, we can work on. We develop more technologies and we expand what, what we have. And we already have these small scale processors. We have like uh, scale processors who are also uh, already producing maybe 60 plus uh, seaweed products, this is something we can scale up. So it's an opportunity to scale up to have uh, more of these uh, productions. We have the Blue Economy Initiative. Uh, this is worldwide and in, in Tanzania, we, are, we have, for example, in Zanzibar, the Ministry of Blue Economy, which we can, we can um, use. And, and the, even the mainland uh, government, they are looking at seaweed as one of the areas where blue economy will be uh, focusing. And of course, we have the whole of African continent and the others for, for market. These are opportunities that we can tap into. So uh, because of all this that we have said, if, if we look at uh, um, opportunities where we can collaborate in the future, all of us who are uh, in this, in this uh, webinar and the others, we can uh, really uh, collaborate in technology development. We need to scale out the technologies that we have so, so far uh, developed. But we more technologies that are feasible in, in our environment. We need to expand the market. We can collaborate in this market expansion. It's something that all of us uh, can work together. It's something we are looking into the future. And uh, we can collaborate also on sea safety because now we are talking about our farmers going into the deep water areas. So we can actually collaborate in uh, uh, making sure that our, our farmers are safe in the deep water areas uh, through um, safe, uh, technologies, safe uh, materials and equipment. And of course, we can collaborate in the, the blue, economy, blue climate, which is something that is, is a, a global. So we can all collaborate on this. That is all for the seaweed cluster. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Flower. Um, so our next speaker is Akarapo Mungunda. 
Um, Akarpa, are you happy to share your screen now? Um, so Akarpa is a member of the monitoring team at Kelp Blue, um, a company cultivating kelp forests. Um, she focuses on assessing kelp growth and the impact kelp forests may have on biodiversity. And her experience lies in surveillance and assessment, marine protection, oceanographic research and acoustics. Um, brilliant, over, over to you. Okay, can you hear me fine? Yes. Perfect. Um, all right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity. Allow me to briefly walk you through what we do at Kelp Blue, who and what we are, um, and everything that we're doing with um, the kelp. Uh, Kelp Blue is a commercial company looking to grow seaweed offshore uh, in Namibia. This is to restore ocean health and uh, for carbon sequestration. We will be harvesting the top 10% of um, the kelp for, uh, to make nature-friendly products such as pharmaceuticals and biostimulants. You may be wondering why, why are we uh, using the kelp? So just to briefly show you the species that we're working with or that we're going to grow. The kelp species that we're growing is called Microcystis periphera, and this is a giant kelp species that grows up to 65 meters high. Uh, kelp is a very good source of uh, valuable and marketable products. Uh, it's one of the largest and fastest uh, growing organisms in the planet. Um, it is The forests are known for marine uh, biodiversity boosting. A lot of animals live within the kelp forests feed on the kelp forest and et cetera. So this will really help uh, uh, the marine biodiversity boosting. Uh, kelp is also good for carbon sequestration and it's able to grow on artificial structures. And this species can be harvested every three months. We are situated uh, in Namibia. So Kelp Blue's first location is in Namibia. Um, and this is because uh, uh, let me just go back, sorry. Uh, we are located in Namibia. This is because Namibia is an ideal location for, uh, in terms of nutrients and climate. Uh, as you know, the upwelling system is really strong and nutritionist along the Namibian coast. Uh, because of uh, physical uh, geography, uh, the physical geography along the Namibian coast is also ideal for this type of uh, kelp farming. And the human factors are, uh, that are in Namibia also support uh, this sort of industry. Our vision is therefore to uh, grow this farm offshore in Namibia, uh, harvest it and then process it on land to uh, make now the uh, um, products that, we, that I spoke about before. These are the biostimulants, arginates, uh, pharmaceuticals and, and such. Looking over the horizon, we are also looking to expand all over the world um, in countries such as Chile, the US, um, ta 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 uh, Tasmania, New Zealand and such. Uh, because we, we will, we'll, we're going to uh, uh, build more of these forests all over the world to, uh, for pharmaceutical purposes as well. Moving, to, moving towards our work streams. Oh, no, no. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Moving towards our work streams, we have a few work streams as part of the company. Uh, one of which is engineering. This is setting up the structure and making uh, sure that structure is rigid. Uh, this is for the kelp to grow on. And we have biosystems. Uh, this is to grow the kelp. So we have a hatching system. We grow it in the lab and we put it out there on the structure in the water. And then after this, we have the harvesting and processing uh, work stream systems, which are uh, basically just to harvest and then process it um, either offshore or on land. Uh, and lastly, um, we have the environmental monitoring um, uh, uh, work stream, which I am a part of. And this is in accordance, in accordance with the EIA, the environmental work stream collects and still continues to collect data um, offshore, coastal, um, uh, using different methods, such as environmental DNA. And this we have, we are uh, in collaboration with a company in the US, in the UK, pardon me, called Nature Metrics. And we use, so for them, we take water samples and pass it through a, a sieve 
and we send them the DNA. We have also visuals as part of our uh, tools, satellites, lab work. Uh, we also do more to chemistry and nutrients. And we also do uh, acoustic measurements, both passive and active. And this is all to feed into understanding uh, the environment in and around the kelp forests and um, assessing uh, any changes that may happen during, before, during and after uh, as the kelp grows. And this is of course, uh, to the greater goal of carbon sequestration. This does however, come with uh, challenges uh, because this is a very uh, new uh, offshore farming. This is new research. Few studies have been done. So, and we are also learning as a company as we go. Um, the challenges also come with, uh, that come with this as the uh, logistics. Uh, logistics can uh, be uh, uh, quite damping as, you know, uh, they cause delays in the whole operation. But this uh, in turn has, uh, or offers a great amount of opportunities such as collaborations that we have with the uh, um, Kelp Forest Foundation in research. We have a few students doing uh, masters and PhD uh, studies that help us you know, uh, integrate everything. And the local government also offers a lot of support uh, because, as they're leaning towards uh, more sustainable projects uh, in growing the Namibian economy. Uh, the community, we have community engagements as well. This, this also, uh, uh, opens or allows for more engagements with the community and opportunities there as well. Uh, strengthening the youth and learning, teaching them about the ocean and what we're doing as well. And we welcome, of course, more opportunities as we as a company would like to uh, collaborate and learn uh, um, as well. Uh, yes, that is all. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Proscovia Alando from Sama K Hub. Um, do you want to begin sharing your slides? Um, so Proscovia is a social entrepreneur who's keen on transforming the Kenyan aquaculture industry to be more sustainable and more inclusive, especially focused on women and youth. She's the founder of Sama K Hub, which is a startup that offers consultancy to fish farmers. And she is also the co-founder of Resect, a company that specializes in black soldier fly as an alternative protein for um, animal feed. Over, over to you. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, you're perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, today I'll be speaking about uh, my experience as a woman and youth in the African aquaculture industry and how what I did to overcome the challenges, although there are still several other challenges that we are facing. I'll start with a brief introduction about myself. I did my bachelor's in applied aquatic science from Egerton University and further pursued a master's in sustainable aquaculture from the University of Stirling after securing a fully funded scholarship by the Commonwealth Commission. I currently work as the founder of Samaki Hub and co-founder of Resect, and I'm also a fellow at the African Food Fellowship and ReFuture. I'm also a game changer at the Food Systems Games Changers Lab. Initially, I wanted to establish a fish farm to provide healthy protein for the Kenyan population, especially with the high level of malnutrition and the low fish consumption level. I also wanted to empower my community through job creation while conserving the environment. I was faced with uh, several challenges, including limited capital, high cost of production, and constraints while accessing productive input, such as credit. Since I don't own assets, uh, such as land, I could not, that I could use to serve as collateral for loans. I also tried to apply for jobs to raise my capital, but due to limited employment opportunities, there were no jobs, uh, there were no job offers. And so I was left with only one option, which was to find ways uh, to lower my cost of production. More information about my experience can be found on the fish site. I realized that the high cost of production in aquaculture was due to high cost of feeds, and usually the feeds account up to 70% of the total production cost. And the high cost of feed is due to high cost of protein. And traditionally, the main protein source that we use is usually fish meal. Uh, we find that fish meal, fish meal or soya bean, we find that fish meal is expensive due to overfishing, use of illegal fishing gear, and pollution of water bodies. 
there's also an inconsistent supply and quality of fish meal. My quest for alternative protein to replace the unsustainable fish meal led me to black soldier fly insects. Uh, initially, there was a team uh, from Resect conducting uh, black soldier fly trials at Egerton University. I decided to join them to try and see if I could use the black soldier fly as alternative protein uh, for fish feed in my uh, co-farm. And eventually, I became one of the co-founders at Resect. The black soldier fly is a black fly with white legs. And it's a good source of protein and fat. The good thing about the black soldier fly is that they don't really spread diseases. They're not aggressive and they're not pests. When we look at the amino acid profile between the black soldier fly larvae meal, house fly larvae meal, and fish meal, we find that that of black soldier fly is equal to or superior to that of fish meal. So it can be used as alternative protein in animal feed formulation. The idea of research and Samaki Hub is to work through a circular economy basis where waste from one system can be used as input in another system. There are several opportunities for UK Africa aquaculture collaboration. For instance, we have uh, some investment opportunities at the moment. Currently, Samaki Hub and Sustain Switzerland have projects in Kenya, Tanzania, and Zambia. These are both investment project, training projects in the aquaculture industry to ensure sustainability and to increase the productivity of uh, aquaculture in the region. For instance, in Tanzania, there's currently an expansion of the first sustainable cage culture fish farm in Lake Tanganyika called Mpende Fisheries. We are seeking an investment of $2.4 million. The type of funding is a mixture of debt, equity, and grants. Also at Reset, we are seeking to increase production and to provide sustainable supply of protein for aquafeed. The overall needed investment at Reset to establish a viable commercial facility is around $250,000. That is inclusive of CAPEX and OPEX. The type of funding we are seeking at Reset is a mixture of grants, equity, and debt. There are several other uh, projects and investment opportunities, and I'm happy to share about them afterwards. At Samaki Hub, we also have opportunities for collaboration. We are currently seeking to establish the biggest integrated aquaculture facility in East Africa, including fish farming, a primary processing unit, and value adding unit. We also want to establish the aquaculture training center because we realize there's need for uh, training on the skills in the industry. We want to provide fish for the Kenyan market and tap into the export market while creating opportunities for women in the industry. More information about Samakia plants can be found on the African Food Fellowship website. Thank you. These are my contact details. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions and if you're looking for collaboration. Back to you, Joanne. Thank you very much. Um, so our final speaker for this session is Harry Raza for my mom, Zirabe. Um, Harry, if you're there, brilliant, you are already on it. Um, so Harry is the National Technical Advisor for Livelihoods in Madagascar for the international NGO Blue Ventures. He's been involved in sandfish farming since 2017 as, and is an alumnus of the Southeast Asian Fisheries Development Center in the Philippines. Um, Harry, over over to you. Oh, you're, you've disappeared. <laughs> Lost you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Joanna, for the introduction, and hello, everyone. Um, yeah. For today, uh, I'm going to talk about community-based sunfish farming in Madagascar, uh, and I'll share with you the main challenges and opportunities of this particular aquaculture activity. In this diagram. You can see the aquaculture model. Uh, the private company, Indian Ocean Trade Bank, IOT, owns the only sunfish hatchery and the artificial reproduction patent in Madagascar. Um, farmers sign a contract with this private company to have access to sunfish juveniles. Um, the farmers then grow sunfish in sea pens and carry out 
or related aquaculture work, such as uh, stocking, monitoring, etc. And once the animals weight more than 400 grams, they are harvested in collaboration with Ocean Farmers, which is IoT's private sister company. And finally, some fish are processed in IoT's factory and exported. In this model, Blue Ventures uh, supports farmers, but also balances the relationship between farmers and private companies. Many challenges were encountered in the development of the activity. Disease and the security system have been major challenges. Uh, to illustrate, in 2015, a massive disease known as skin ulceration disease spread and killed many sunfish. And uh, due to the lack of knowledge about this disease at that time, we decided to remove all the farms and we did some trials to improve our farming model. Uh, for security, it is a big challenge as our farming areas are in very uh, remote locations where bandits attack villages from time to time. And also uh, sunfish species is highly sought after. So the risk of theft is really high. Another challenge is the, that the activity uh, require uh, investment and mid to long-term funding. So community cannot easily mobilize this funding. Um, this is where uh, the role of an NGO like Blue Ventures is really important uh, to mobilize funding until the activity is profitable. Uh, there is also uh, the fact that only one company owns uh, the archery, Sunfish Archery in Madagascar, and uh, is also the only buyer uh, stipulated in the contract signed by the farmer. Um, challenges arose, for example, when uh, at some point the commercial partner decided to change the purchase price, or when it decided to change some aspect of uh, technical farming model. And this is where Blue Ventures uh, stepped in as an intermediary between uh, the farmers and the private companies to find win-win solutions. Regarding opportunities, um, sunfish farming does not require the use of antibiotics or uh, feeding the animals as they are natural filter feeders. So uh, it is a considerable reduction of uh, operational costs of farming. Uh, furthermore, uh, the farming activities do not require special skills um, and are uh, accessible to a wide range of uh, community. Um, finally, sea cucumber farming can help reduce pressure on fisheries as uh, fishers involved in aquaculture activities uh, to not rely solely on income from fishing activities. Sea cucumbers are commercially exploited in more than 70 countries. All sea cucumbers are called trepong after processing, and uh, trepong is considered a delicacy and uh, made design in Asia, where the prices are good. Since uh, 2000, while sea cucumber populations have collapsed, while demand for trepang has been increasing. And there is a real gap in the supply of trepang in the market, and aquaculture will have to meet these needs. To conclude, uh, we can say that community based sunfish farming is a real opportunity. Uh, the activity can generate profit, but requires uh, funding and partnership for its development. Challenges exist, but they can be overcome as illustrated in this presentation. In Madagascar, uh, the experience is showed that the activity can be profitable. Uh, these uh, more than 10 years experiences have enabled lessons to be learned and good practices to be acquired. And now, uh, the expertise can be widely shared. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. 
Thank you very much. Um, so we've now got just a couple of minutes for um, some questions. So if I can invite um, our case study presenters back to join me, that would be brilliant. Um, I guess to start with um, a question really on um, access to innovation. Um, so in all your talks, we heard um, about your, your desire and approach to, to be innovative within your business or, or within the sector. What recommendations would you make to others um, trying to drive innovation within aquaculture in Africa? Maybe we can start with, um, with uh, maybe Ogarba would be a good person um, to take that uh, first attempt at that question. Hi, Joanna. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Can you hear me fine? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, can you please uh, repeat the question? Um, how have you approached accessing or identifying innovation within your business? Ah, um, one of the things that we have, um, one of the things that we have uh, dealt with actually is the fact that we have a lot of uh, new, newly uh, graduated students. So I think we, we tackle innovation and new ideas um, that way. Uh, we have uh, uh, hungry new scientists that, are, um, that have like their minds open and willing to do and try anything um, together with the collaboration and the support that we have from the local community, the government, um, the, the Kelp Forest Foundation, all of these young um, scientists, myself as well, um, uh, push, you know, you push towards new ideas instead of what has been done before. One of which is, for example, the environmental DNA um, that we have together with Nature Metrics in the UK. Um, they, what, we what we're trying to do is um, uh, get that information and, you know, maybe put it together with acoustics. Acoustics is also, acoustics is also quite new. Um, um, yeah. Basically, I leaning, leaning on people and, and the skills of people. Leaning, leaning on people, um, the experts, but more importantly, letting the young uh, guys come up with new ideas, you know, because I think that pushes, uh, you know, it, get, it gets done uh, quicker and faster. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. Um, Flower, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on this as well in terms of um, getting innovation into the sector. What's the approach um, that we should be taking? So for innovation, actually, um, in, in for example, in the in the in the seaweed industry, or in any kind of, of um, economic activity, we we need we know that we see that without innovation, we are not going anywhere. Uh, if if we, we we talk of business as usual, we will not change. If we have challenges, climate change, whatever challenges. Without using innovation, we cannot continue with, with, with doing that. It's the same way where, uh, for example, in my, in my seaweed cluster initiative that we, we, we came to innovate because of the challenges that the, the, the farmers were, were, were facing uh, caused by climate change. Climate change is something that you cannot change on your own. So you need to cope with that one. So you need to be innovative in order to cope with uh, uh, those challenges if they are brought by climate change uh, market or anything so innovation is the way of coping with the challenges and uh, coming with with new opportunities uh, developing the our, our businesses and also for for research and for all kind of collaboration mm -hmm. yeah brilliant proscovia do you have anything that you'd like to add there yeah, I think uh, my colleagues have said everything, but I would just say that it's really important for stakeholder engagement and collaboration between different uh, players in the industry. So let's stop working in silos and communicate with others because there's more that we can do when we work together. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so I think, yeah, hearing from all of you, this need for, for speaking um, across the industry, um, enabling young people um, to bring their new ideas to the floor um, and, and really working together. Brilliant, thank you very much. I'm, I'm afraid we don't really have much more time for, for questions here and I'm keen to make sure that we um, get a short break before our, our panel session. Um, so Caroline, I'm gonna hand over to you um, just to, to give us our timings.
Um, great. Thanks, Joanna. And thanks to all the speakers in that last session. Uh, we were going to have a slightly longer break, but due to running quite a quite a long way over, over time, we're going to just break now for 10 minutes. So if we get back at just before 5 to 12, um, that would be great. And we will then be moving on to our past session. We will be now joined by Etienne Henrichsen, who's going to be chairing the session. Um, Etienne is a graduate from Stellenbosch University, has worked in African aquaculture development for 25 years. He's consulted in various countries in aspects like aquaculture policy and strategy development, and has written aquaculture guidelines, tools, business plans, and more for a range of clients. Previously served as chairman of the Aquaculture Association of Southern Africa, he's advised on several African Union projects and has played a role in getting the African chapter of the World Aquaculture Society established. He currently serves as a member of the Advisory Council of the African Fisheries Reform Mechanism, and he heads the sector networking platform known as Aquaculture Africa magazine and leads the aquaculture business component of the EU funded True Fish project in East Africa. So welcome, Etienne. I'm glad that you could join us because I know you had some uh, connection problems earlier. So I will leave it up to you to introduce the panel and start the session. Fantastic. Thank you, Caroline, for that introduction. Uh, yes, I'm back online. I hope uh, it stays that way. We are slightly behind schedule, um, so I'm going to do a very short introduction of the panel and get straight into the discussion. Joining me for the discussion panel uh, are various of, of the people that spoke this morning. Uh, first up is Colin Shelley from Worldfish, uh, also Professor Grant uh, Stentifoot from CFAS, then uh, Margaret uh, Crumlish from Sterling University and Flower um, Musia from the Zanzibar Seaweed uh, Cluster. And then lastly, uh, Harry, and I'm going to challenge myself with a surname. It's Raza Fumamun Jirab. I hope, Harry, I've got that nearly right. Um, but if I haven't, then my sincere apologies. I can see all of the panel members have joined me. Thank you very much. Uh, before we get into the first questions, I'm just back from Egypt in the last day or so from the African Aquaculture Conference, and I can tell you I am extremely excited because it looks like we are heading towards getting a world conference in Africa for aquaculture in 2025. So that's fresh news from Egypt, and uh, I can see many of you online today that I believe will be joining us in that world conference in two or three years time. Getting straight into the questions, we don't have a lot of time for this panel session. Um, I can see one of my panel members, Colin, uh, is online. And Colin, you would know from Egypt that I've often questioned the sense of introducing international technology into Africa. Uh, not because I don't believe in the technology, but because I think the challenges in African aquaculture are, are quite unique. Um, so Colin, let's start with you. Which, uh, which technologies internationally are the so-called low-hanging fruit that we can bring into Africa quickly and effectively? Um, Colin, I'm just going to give you a minute or two to, uh, to comment on that, and then we'll move to some other panel members. Thank you. Sure. Oh, thanks, Etienne, and, and good to see you again. The, um, I mean, aeration, you know, in, in many places, just having pond, the difference in productivity between aeration and not is enormous. And so that, I mean, that is one of the most basic, you know, low hanging fruits, as, as, as you suggest. Um, and I think uh, other things that can be done to increase productivity, you know, around farming ventures, in terms of you know very is about integrated aquaculture i mean in bangladesh um you know there's a lot of use of the water from ponds also to grow you know vegetables and fruit nearby you know on the banks and things like that so um that, as you said there's some very simple things that can be done to increase uh, productivity might leave it there just to get things going great thank you thank you for that colin um Grant, do you want to do you want to just perhaps comment for a minute on that as well? Uh, any any groundbreaking technologies that we can bring into Africa quickly and easily? Yeah, I mean, I take a point about you know sometimes 
mm-hmm. overdoing the technology can be quite can be quite sort of a thing, can't it? You know, we all go in and suggest there's some great molecular techniques that are really becoming more available. And I think although it, it's important to sort of not um, you know, to put the appropriate technologies for, say, health control um, and health detection or disease detection uh, in place. I think, you know, we sh- the technologies which are now using molecular approaches are becoming cheaper and cheaper. So although they may initially seem to be, you know, slightly inappropriate to be used, they are becoming much cheaper, much better, much quicker, much more field-based, much more applicable to be used. And so I, I, although it's not going to be applicable everywhere, I think let's not discount some of those really high tech approaches. I mean, what I'm very keen on um, myself is, is, is trying to, and I'm a pathologist, we've spent a lot of time chasing disease over the years, the outcomes, the experience based system, they call, called it earlier, where we go in and we'd say what happened. I think a lot of these technologies will allow us to avoid that happening. Um, and I think that people who are working on health want to be moving to that space of the pre-emergent phase rather than describing emergent diseases, which most of us have spent our careers doing. So I think that those high-tech approaches, because they're becoming cheaper, can also help us to move conceptually into a understanding health rather than understanding disease mindset. So um, just I'll, I'll leave it at that. I mean, there are cost implications of that. I think sharing resources, getting young people trained up in them, um, understanding how they that they can be used cheaply and quickly to understand health would be I would recommend. Great, thank you, Grant. Um, Margaret, uh, I believe in your presentation you you referred to to the role of SANISA and and how important networking is across Africa. From my own perspective, uh, I've had a stint in, in networking, still working in networking, and we've seen that uh, the cost of access to information is, is often a barrier. Margaret, your views, you are with Sterling, you are involved in information sharing in Africa. Um, do you agree, Margaret, that the cost of information might be uh, hampering the progress of aquaculture in Africa. Margaret, your views on that just very shortly. Um, thanks very much. I, I didn't mention Sanissa in my actual presentation, but I'm quite aware of the Sanissa platform from the work that colleagues at Sterling have done. Um, generally, in terms of education, there are some barriers. Of course, there are some barriers. However, I think that the digital platforms have really changed how we exchange information. I mean, look at us now. You know, we've seen some fantastic opportunities here. We are able to link up together a lot better than we ever have. So I think that whilst we have maybe been forced into this space and there will always be an opportunity and there will always be a need for us to deliver things face to face and in person. And I'm delighted to hear about this conference that's going to happen. Um, You know, to actually how you behave with people uh, in, a fa- in a face-to-face situation is so different to how you behave on a digital platform. However, we are getting better at this and the technology is in our pocket. So over the years in aquaculture, there have been several programs where they have used farmers-based workshops, where you use mobile phone technology. It's been there, but it's perhaps never been harnessed in the way because we haven't had the global buy in And what coronavirus has done for us and the pandemic is it's changed how we access the information and how we communicate together. And that could be very um, good in lots of ways in terms of we can now perhaps exchange information from a disease perspective, for example, or a health perspective, for example. We don't have to wait for publications to come out necessarily for people to say, hey, I've got this issue. We can do that, but it's going to have to take an investment in people's time. And I think it's not the digital side and it's not the the drive. It's how much time we actually can invest in this uh, digital platforms going forward. So I think there's some really good stuff coming out, but we have to be careful that we actually keep the quality of the information that we will be beneficial to everyone. So accessibility is one thing, but quality control is the other. 
Great, great. Thank you, Margaret. I'm, I'm, I've got a passion for networking in Africa, so I'm really excited with what you're saying uh, around the opportunities that, uh, that we have available um, and, and really looking forward to, to an era now where information sharing becomes, becomes easier. Flower, um, it's, it's nice to see you again. We haven't spoken for a while. Um, Flower, in, in your particular area of interest, which is seaweed, um, do you think there are technologies in seaweed production in other areas of the world that could quickly be applied in Africa and could benefit Africa? Flower, your views on, on that? Um, thank you very much, Etienne. It's good to see you, yes. Um, I I know that there are, there are technologies out there because the kind of technology that we need they are te technologies that can work in our environment. For example, if if, you are, if you are, our sea, our seas are rough, we need technologies that will that uh, can sustain uh, this kind of, of tension from, from water currents. Um, I know that there are technologies in in India, for example. Uh, I worked with some colleagues there who who, who uh, uh, gave me um, information about uh, about certain technologies that are being developed there uh, using uh, structures really that can be can be brought to to, to Africa. Uh, we are we also have um, uh, colleagues from from the US who are thinking of uh, some kind of, of um, cages uh, that they can use a really strong um, type. Of of galvanized iron that can sustain all kind of uh, um, waves from, from, from the oceans. So yes, I believe that there are uh, uh, farming technologies out there which we can uh, tap, which we can bring and, uh, and they use in, a, in our African environment. Great, great. Thank you, Flower, for that. Um, Harry, you haven't had a chance uh, to give an opinion, and uh, I'm going to give you a difficult one. Um, Harry, we, we've realized over many years that, that aquaculture is not about just putting a fish in a cage. There's a, there's a very extensive value chain uh, which, which needs attention. Um, Harry, in, in your view, uh, or let me rephrase that, um, We've seen sometimes that projects from, from Europe and Asia and the US, they focus very specifically on one element of the value chain. Um, sometimes these projects fail or these technologies fail due to the isolation of, of one area of the value chain. Um, Harry, in, in your opinion, how can we ensure that when technologies are transferred to aquaculture, um, how can we ensure that the entire value chain is, is, is dragged along? And I know this is a philosophical question, but maybe your views on that, Harry. Yeah, thanks for this question, <laughs> difficult one. Yeah, um, I think it is necessary that all stakeholders are linked uh, within the whole value chain. Um, yeah, for us, uh, I take the example of Sunfish farming. We have uh, our private partner who owns the hatchery and also who export the final product, the trepang. Uh, but uh, they are working collaboratively with the community to grow out uh, the sea cucumber. Um, uh, it is not the perfect example because we just have one hatchery. If uh, hatchery uh, is not working, the whole value chain is uh, uh, will collapse. So I think um, it is necessary to have many stakeholders uh, for each part of the value chain. So uh, if one part is not working, uh, there are some uh, other uh, actors or stakeholders who can uh, fill the gap. I think that's the solution. Great, Harry, thanks. I, I really put you on the spot there, Harry, with that value chain question. But uh, I wonder if there's any of the other panel members that, that want to comment on, on us not getting caught up in, in improving one element of the value chain. How do we take the whole value chain and, and drag it along 
Grant, I, I don't know if you're frowning because you're thinking or you're nodding because you want to answer, but I, that's your view, Grant. Well, I, I completely agree with I completely agree with you. I mean, that's, that has to happen, doesn't it? There's, there were some brilliant examples actually in the in the presentations there of people who were doing that, you know, and and, and it's I think you're right, it's done, it seems to be done maybe a lot more when there's a necessity to do so than maybe using examples from Europe where where it isn't that, you know. So I think that it's important to remember that. People are already look like they're already doing it um, in many cases in Africa, which is brilliant. Um, I, all I would all those would do is flag up for me the One Health approach actually was absolutely about bringing people into this conversation who are not in the conversation. And these these value chains they they also extend way beyond the actual chain itself into you know including parts of government that you never thought were interested or should be interested in how this industry succeeds. So I think it's just about moving the whole um, you know, sector of aquaculture much, much more into the, into the sort of the conscience of, of nations, really. I think you know, we, we are all converts to this. We're all sitting here talking to each other and we all get it. You know, we're, we're all in this. But there's a lot of people in society who don't get it. Um, I mean, it, even from the UK, right? Where I live, there's loads of people who understand absolutely the sheep on the hillside or the fishing boat that's going out the, from the harbour, but they don't understand anything about aquaculture. They think it's a specialist domain. And I think that the more we have these conversations, the more we're going to realise that we haven't got to convince people that, that is the case. It's just going to become a necessity and more and more people get involved with it, whether they think they work in or on aquaculture. So I think it's a journey, I think, and it's going to take... I, probably till my kids are my age before it becomes just a, an accepted thing that we don't talk about anymore. Like we don't talk about agriculture in this respect. So I think it's going to take time, but the, the integration you're talking about also extends just culturally within the country more than just in the value chain itself. But that's the, that's what I would add. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Grant. Colin, I, I see you, you also want to add to that. Yeah. Thanks, Etienne. Um, I guess with regards to you know, value chain development and improving them, I, I see a lot of what I call very descriptive work about value chains. And I, I think what's more useful is sort of investigative work where you dig down into the value chains to do some real analysis of them. Um, there was a, a group, um, I think, at the uh, Queensland University of Technology working with some British UK researchers, Ben Dent is one of them. And uh, they've been running a course on like agribusiness value chain improvements for some years. And uh, that, that's, he's recently produced a book on that. So for anybody looking to uh, use that investigative approach to value chain development, I, I strongly recommend a copy of that book. All right, great. Thanks, Thanks for that, Colin. Um, Margaret, I want to get back to you and, and to Flower, to both of you. Um, and just to get your, your views, we, we very easily speak about transferring technology from, from Europe or Asia or the US, but we forget that there's a role for innovation on the African continent in taking aquaculture forward as well. Um, Margaret, your view on on, on us not just dumping technology on, I, I don't mean dumping in a derogatory way, but how can we also stimulate innovation? Um, because innovation is, is homegrown technology, if, if I can put it like that. Margaret, your view on that? Oh, that's a challenging question. Um, wish you'd given me Grant's one. Um, I, uh, I think it's really difficult to do this. And this is part of the reason I put into the presentation about the Pangasia story. Because, you know, we have a lot of technology, you have a lot of innovation um, that can be imported, it can be exported, and it can be developed in-house. And in-house, I mean on the ground and the farms and the systems. Or perhaps I should be following Colin's comment there a little bit more inclusive and say along the value chain. You know, so you can really take those innovations along. How do you get people to use them? And I think that's where the whole education side comes in. You know. I'm going to give an example of something that's close to me, which is about looking at um, how do you stop diseases? How do you prevent disease outbreaks? 
And this is something I've spent a lot of time and effort on. We've produced commercial vaccines. We can't get people to use them. Yeah. I mean, you just have to look at coronavirus. I know this is maybe a little bit controversial, but you know, <laughs> there are reasons, but there are, there are serious uh, social and cultural reasons why people do not want to do X, Y, and Z. And it's really, this for me was kind of a real game changer when we brought in dif different disciplines and by that, I mean completely different disciplines, which was the economics. So we understand the financial drivers for, for some of this technology and why people may or may not come into it, but also the psychological side. So in one of our projects, we have a psychologist there who is helping us understand people's beliefs, people's willingness to do things. Um, it's, it, it blows my mind. It really does. I, I don't understand it. For me, it's logical. Why wouldn't you use it? So I think... Yeah. For me, it's not necessarily the technology itself. It's the how is it used to the best of the ability in that situation. And whether that is something that is, you know, lab on a chip or whether that is something that is literally looking at basic hygiene and sanitation practices, they all have their place. How do we get people to use them to me is a bigger challenge um, in my view, but I'm looking forward to hearing what Flower says. Great, thank you, Margaret. Flower, um, same question, but just also if you can elaborate on, on whether in your industry, are you seeing local innovation also playing a role in, in taking aquaculture forward? Thank you, Flower. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, in the, in the seaweed industry, I would say that uh, without the people knowing and uh, and uh, accepting what we want to do it can be a bit challenging to to have uh, uh, aquaculture um, activities going on for example uh, in the in the, the seaweed industry when uh, when the first time we were telling people about using seaweed about eating seaweed you know they were just off just thinking we were crazy or something how can someone eat seaweed and this was only in 2006 but people did not know anything about eating seaweed, about making a seaweed product. So when we were talk, talking to them, they were like, you know, it's in something that they, they, they wouldn't understand. And uh, there are these kind of cultures also, um, maybe not in the seaweed industry, but in the aquaculture in general, you can tell people to use, for example, uh, uh, human waste as, as, a, as, a, as a fertilizer to, 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 to produce, you know, fish and, you know, they will, you know, there are some uh, traditions that will say, what is this? You tell people to, to, to cultivate catfish, they tell you they cannot eat catfish. Um, you know, that, that's the way they are. So uh, I think with Margaret that we need really education. People need to be, to be educated on what we want to do. And it's not like bringing education to them just from the top, you know, just to start at, at the base, to start at community level, to, to start um, uh, uh, bottom up, we can call it, so people, can, so people will understand already what is coming and then accepting before we, uh, we indulge into starting the, the aquaculture uh, activity. Great, great. Thank you, Flower. Um, Grant, you've made a valid comment in the chat panel saying innovation can also be framed as a cultural shift. Um, I'm, I'm seeing that in East Africa where, where tilapia production is growing significantly, yet the post-harvest utilization of that product is not getting any attention because culturally people want to eat a fresh fish instead of a fillet or instead of a canned fish or a prepared fish. Um, so, so I agree with you completely that that cultural shift needs to happen with, with a shift in, in a hopeful shift in innovation. Grant, um, this is not in our, in our preparations for this uh, workshop, but I've recently seen many projects in Africa saying, well, we can adopt European technologies, but then we also want to have access to European markets. Um, and, and that is quite tricky, not only from a biosecurity food safety point of view, but from a logistical point of view. Um, just as, as an opinion from you, Grant, do you see Europe as, as a potential offset market for African aquaculture in the future? 
Well, I think it already it already is, isn't it? I mean, some some nations are already using that as a market. I mean, I, I think, like you say, we we would um most of the sort of the barriers to that market are, are as you mentioned, there are sort of you know hazard based, whether you know they're free from disease or free from hazards to human health, etc. So if it passes those those um those if you like gates, then it then it absolutely could be a market, but um. It's uh, it's also depends on whether you know. I, I think that the prize before that is to actually feed the people of Africa. I would say, I would argue is the first point of of, 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 of agriculture sort of succeeding. Um, but they're they're not mutually exclusive things. Those I mean I think they go hand in hand. The ability to grow food for people and to trade it. Um, so, I mean, as, as everyone knows, seafood is very highly traded. Um, there are there, there could be cultural barriers to to for the reasons everyone just mentioned here about products made in another country going to feed another nation. So maybe the species is wrong or the, you know, the, the perception is wrong or whatever. That, so there's all those barriers which are not necessarily technical and hazard-based, but they're just cultural as well. And But I think that these are all possible barriers to break. But I do think that they're multi-generational. I, th- I think that some of this stuff, and Max mentioned COVID, you know, um, my kids growing up might think that it's a really good idea to have a COVID vaccine, but people in this generation might not thought it was for different reasons. You're never going to convince some people, no. but if you grow up with something, you you can be convinced. And you know, Flower mentioned there how maybe kids growing up now in Tanzania would think eating seaweeds going to be normal, whereas yeah. 20 years ago it wasn't. So sometimes you just have to accept, you know, time is required to change cultures as well. It takes a long time to change cultures. Yeah, yeah, Grant. Thanks, thanks for those insights. We've only got a few minutes left. Um, Harry, Grant has been speaking a little bit about the market perceptions, and and you've made reference that sea cucumber is in demand, and the demand is growing, and production is not necessarily keeping up with that demand. Um, Harry, just maybe as a final thought from your side, do you see? a massive increase in sea cucumber production coming from Africa, let's say, over the next 10 years? Yeah, uh, I think not only from Africa, but also from uh, Asia. Um, We had uh, many meetings with different uh, stakeholders in Philippines, in Indonesia, in Kenya, uh, in Zanzibar, Uh, many uh government and also ngos and private companies want to uh set up hatchery and uh develop the industry of sea cucumber in many different countries so i think uh, uh as you said uh, it uh, the production from aquaculture will increase as the wild population is dis- decreasing so yeah Great, great. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Harry. Uh, Margaret, back to you. Um, Margaret, you've had quite a bit of exposure to to collaborative projects uh, to drive change in in Africa. Um, Do you you see, Margaret, that collaboration continuing? And and particularly from Sterling, do you see a greater role in collaboration across Africa with Sterling um, going forward? I I would love to see uh, the the collaboration continue. And I think where we'd really like to see it is building on what everyone here has already said today. And it's really about taking those broader cross-cutting themes. You know, it's actually about looking at the bigger challenges and how we can collaborate uh, not just through the education programs, not just through specific uh, discipline, challenges but actually those real big challenges you know the actual the ones that make the big difference here and that brings in all the players and I think that's where the the real where it becomes really interesting is you know when you start looking at the how do you address the things that like Grant's been talking about one health you know we've actually all been doing one health and he said this one health for quite some time we just haven't put that label on it you know, and yeah. so we have that, we have quite a lot of depth of knowledge in some of these areas. It's the bringing it together and actually bringing in some of those skill sets and um, experiences 
but really bringing them together in the way that kind of Colin was mentioning about actually looking at the whole value chain and then looking at it as well from the kind of post-harvest market side. We've been very strong on looking at things in the production side from Sterling. And where we need to go now really is start looking at the post-harvest side and into the nutrition side and the marketing and everything that people here have already mentioned. So, uh, yeah, we're very keen to, to, to be part of this, but we will be one of the players. Yeah, you know, that's right. how it has to be. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. We, we have run out of time, but I want to give uh, Flower, you've got 20 seconds for anything that you would like to say as a, as a closing remark, Flower, just a few seconds. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to say that uh, we need, we need uh, collaboration and, and we need partnership to, de to develop our seaweed, our aquaculture industry, if not Africa, if not anywhere, but we all need to collaborate and do synergetic work. Uh, to advance our aquaculture industry. Thank, thank you, Flower. Grant, you've got 15 seconds for a final word before we close the panel. Um, yes, just to collaborate. I mean, I, I, one thing I would say is, you know, whatever comes out at the end of a meeting like this, which is very technology focused, um, consider how it links to the broader government aspirations in that country, because they're going to be vital in getting anything done there. So linking up that public private chain is, is really important. Great, thank you, Grant. Uh, Colin, five seconds to close off. Aquaculture's got a great future in Africa. Great, that was nice and short, Colin. Thanks for keeping it so brief. Um, right, that is the end of our panel discussion. Thank you, it was a little bit rushed. Um, I hope many of you on this forum will join me when we have our next discussion on Aquaculture Africa magazine that's coming up in a few weeks. But otherwise, I'm going to hand back over to Caroline. Thank you for the session. Caroline, it's all yours. Thank you, Etienne. Thank you. That was great. And thanks to all our panel members. That was a really interesting discussion. So thank you for all taking part. Um, we are now going to move on to our networking sessions, which are going to be slightly shorter than we had originally planned, just because we've run over time slightly. Um, but just a few top tips before you get put into your breakout rooms. Uh, it's going to be an un unfacilitated spe speed networking session. So put your video and microphone on so that you can talk to people. Introduce yourself in the chat. Give your name your organization and your email and make the, the most of the opportunity to speak to those you wouldn't have done otherwise. Also, um, if you want to 